He's the highest paid chief still, and he's taking freebies. The average person, they have an image and a behavior model of what they think a criminal is. But the truth is, exactly. most of them are con men. One guy goes, get on the ground, I'm hit! Richie, you took $350,000 from the Mitermans. And he just goes, no way, I took 180. Oh my God! And then I go, you didn't get the money? He's like, no, I didn't get the money. I was so terrified. Oh. One really odd act of kindness on my part, not seven years off my sentence. When I was a junior in high school, I got a call from the Army baseball coach, and that was big. So I went up and did the visit and kind of fell in love, and it solidified over the summer. The following summer, I went down. My brother was in the military. He was a dentist in the Army at Fort Bragg, and I went down and spent a week with him. He introduced me to some grads, West Point grads, and I was like, yeah, I think I could do this, and, and that's what happened. So were you so, thinking career? You know, I never really, honestly, I don't, I don't think I went either way. I don't think I thought either way. I was kind of just like, hey, whatever happens, happens. Let me see how this works out. I was fortunate. I had a nice run. Um, I was a field artillery officer at first, and then I, I branch transferred over into something called civil affairs, which is the Army, it, basically the Army's intel on the special operations side. A lot of research, a lot of due diligence, a lot of like uh, hearts and minds, they call it. So spending time in a foreign country to kind of see what that looked like. Right. and what the need was in what order to this? kind of move forward. So I graduated in 86 from West Point um, and got out of the Army in 94. So a bunch of time in between. Uh, so spent the first three kind of doing the artillery side, which is cool. It's a combat arms mission, um, firing a lot of big rounds, big cannons downrange, blowing things up. Um, and then the uh, civil affairs side came a little bit later. So that kind of started to get me interested in the future career path, which right. was uh, maybe the CIA, uh, maybe the FBI, maybe another intel community, um, maybe NSA or you know, DNI, whatever that would look like. So um, I did get an opportunity to do both, a little bit of both on a cross. So the Army and the agency kind of worked together at a time on civil affairs teams. Okay. So I did a bunch of that, which was cool. And then the FBI recruited me. And it was a funny story. They were like, um, hey, we'd really like you to come over to the FBI. And I was like, ah, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And the guy said, hey, man, this isn't a party invitation. You can't RSVP, no. Right. I was like, oh, well, what do I do? You know, if, what I, I don't want to do that. He goes, oh, you can resign. And I'm sitting here like this. I'm just like, is there any more information? He goes, no. Resign from what? The the military? Just, just get out of get out of the military. And, so it's like get hey, out of the agency. We're and, we're taking you from here. Yeah. And you're you're now being you're now being enveloped by the, by FBI, the bureau. Yeah. And if you don't want to, you quit. That's it. If you don't want to, you what know, if you're I want to in the military. Well, you could have done I could have done that, but I think I had burned some bridges along the way right. no. with that port. You know. Go ahead. Um <laughs> so so I kind of was like, okay, I understand the opportunity is here. It it was something that I wanted to do, but I was hoping that I had a little bit more of a choice, you know. Right. So I was hoping that I was the one that was going to make that decision. Um, you know, that didn't really ha didn't really happen. Um, I had a run during the time where I thought about corporate America. Let me go and interview, right, and see what that looks like. So I did some interviews with some pharmaceutical companies and some insurance companies. And I would just sit and say, holy shit, I can't, I just can't see myself doing this. Yeah. You know, it, it's just not going to work for me. I'm not going to be happy. I'm not going to be productive. I'm not going to be a good husband, father, whatever that looked like. So um, I what? wind up making a great choice and staying in the bureau. So you go to, you go to Quantico, right? Go to Quantico. Do you? Yeah. Okay. 20 weeks when I went through. So um, pretty good training. The funny thing is coming out of like West Point and uh, coming out of the army, um, one of my buddies who had gone, um, he had gone through a couple, maybe a year before me. And he said, oh, dude, what do you see? Like, it's totally professional. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, yeah, you know, they actually come out to your car when you pull up. They carry your stuff to your room. <laughs> was he lying? They do this stuff. So <laughs> that's what I was like, oh, yeah, you know. He says, yeah, they're like, it's crazy. Cater you know, to respectful. You. So I'm like, oh, okay. So I pull up in front and out comes a bunch of people and they have like hotel type racks put all my stuff on hey mr diorio how are you, you welcome thought it was a joke I no i did too and I, then i was still like did he set this up you know, i, I thought happened? you were gonna go is hey, somebody no. get my stuff they were like, get the fuck out of right. here that's what i thought too and it never got harder than that and now some of the people that i went through with like it's the hardest thing they ever did 
right? And, you know, the big part of it is shooting, right? So getting the handgun, a lot of people right. had not ever touched a gun, which sometimes is better. Um, so we had, we actually had a couple people that said, oh, like first three days, they show you these awful videos yeah. of gun violence and it's awful and it's shocking. And if you haven't seen it before, which I had seen a lot of it before, um, live and in person, um, it's shocking. And we had a couple of people just say, Hey, I, I don't want to do this. Like I can't carry a gun. I thought I could. <laughs> Now's the but best. I, I don't about that feel earlier. I could do that anymore or, you know, carry a gun every day and have the chance that this could happen. And so we're like, Oh, and the instructors were like, really? Okay. You know? So, so then, it, so Quantico was, was, uh, I'd say half classroom, a quarter, probably shooting and then a quarter of practical exercises. So you go out to this thing called Hogan's Alley and you'd practice how to make an arrest and the the uh, role players were great. You know, role players would act like, oh yeah, you know, uh, right. I'm having a hard, you know, you have to figure out what to do right, what to do wrong. Um, there was like a code red call in case somebody was hurting somebody else by accident, you know, when you're putting handcuffs on, like, whoa, code red, you know, you're going to rip my shoulder out. Don't do it that way. Um, I thought it was great. The interview and interrogation work was fantastic. The instructors we had were really good. Um, and then that just improved over time. I had done some of that in the military. Uh, so I was, you know, I don't think I was formally trained in the military. You kind of just pick it up with a lot of the interrogation work that we did uh, in civil affairs. Right. Um, but then all of a sudden you realize, wow, you know, these guys are adding to what I already know and yeah. what I already had in some of the different things. And, and most of it is just very, it's technique based training at Quantico that is, uh, elicits the responses that you kind of think that you should get, you know, so you're eliciting responses based on evidence and predication that you already have, um, you know, which is important. You know, it's important to also stay focused. Um, I just saw that we were talking about this, but poor interrogation, uh, that American nightmare, that that uh, Netflix series oh, yeah. about right. the couple and, and everything that happened and the FBI agent that did the polygraph. Um, you failed. You failed. You, failed. you know, you and, then he, and then he goes on just to threaten yeah. as opposed to, first off, parameterizing the polygraph itself by getting a good interview and a good interview up front so that you could easily tell whether or not the guy's going to lie pretty quickly if certain things don't match up. Right. So poorly done, you know, so poorly done. The FBI in general in that case, so poorly done. Um, and we're getting a lot more of that. But um, but I thought Quantico in my time in 98 going through, yeah. I, I still felt like we were the knights in shining armor that would come in and do things the right way and work hard and be dedicated and committed to the job and, um, you know, get results based on evidence, uh, based on truth of that evidence, based on corroboration on that evidence, not be weaponized like the Bureau is today with some of the bozos that have are there and have been there. Uh, Jim Comey being number one bozo, um, you know, really destroyed the Bureau. Uh, I mean, you had, I came in under Louis Free, just an amazing man, uh, great person. Uh, and an honest, honest to goodness, true FBI uh, agent at heart. He was an FBI agent. You know, right. he's the only director since Hoover that, and before or since, um, that has was an agent and then came up, you know, didn't really come up the ranks. I mean, he was appointed after the fact, after being a federal judge and after being a prosecutor. But um, Bob Mueller, I, I mean, is what he was. You know, he was, a, he was an admin guy. So he, we went from the FBI to the FBA under him, Federal right. Bureau of Administration, and uh, we saw that and during the whole form, Russia probe. Former U.S. attorney, right? Former U.S. attorney, uh, smart guy, um, surrounded himself with smart people, uh, had the the ability, um, the innate ability to ask the one question that you were never prepared for. So you would go in and do a briefing, and I had the chance to brief him several times. And You know, you would go through all your notes and just prep hard and um, think to yourself like, man, I think I got everything. I just hope he doesn't ask this one question because I really don't have an answer for it. Mm -hmm. And I don't really know how I'm going to get an answer between now and the briefing. You'd sit down and he'd go through your briefing and he'd ask that question All right. every fucking time. So um, I felt like he was great for the view. And then when we got Comey, started out hot and you know pretty good for the first month or so, calling people congratulations, it's good to know you, whatever you need, and then just turned into a complete, you know, boob. Um, you know, just became 
became different for the Bureau than what we actually needed. Like the Bureau's job is to, is to investigate, is to provide evidence, but not to make decisions on prosecution. Right. We don't do that. We have a voice at the table, you know, when you're sitting with a federal prosecutor and, and you want, you know, hey, look, I, I think the, um, you know, I think this guy did or didn't do it based on the evidence. You have that right, but they have the right to charge and they're going to do that. Right. This guy just jumped out and said, yeah, I'm going to charge, you know, we're not charging uh, Secretary Clinton. Um, we're not charging this one. We're not charging that one. Sec- you know, Hillary Clinton case is the one that's out there in the public. Yeah. There's other cases that he did that on. Um, sta- stepped back into his role as a, he was another U.S. attorney out on the West Coast. Stepped out on, um, you know, a, kind of back into that world instead of just saying, yeah, we don't really have the responsibility to provide prosecutorial decisions. That's up to, uh, you know, the the uh, attorney general. That's up to Loretta, Loretta Lynch at the time. Um so, well, back to like when you left Quantico, uh, yeah. where were you assigned? So I went, originally went to New Jersey. And then after 9-11, I went, I, I spent a ton of time overseas. So doing some, um, doing a lot of interrogation work, doing a lot of uh, terrorism work, um, uh, doing a lot of work down in um, Gitmo, those kinds of, those kinds of things. They took, they took my military experience and kind of exploited it. I won't say exploits the wrong word, but kind of utilized, utilized it yeah. uh, in order to kind of get better results at the time. And, and I was placed in a better spot. So when I first came in, um, you know, I was talking right. about those cases, the public corruption cases, um, the fun type things, the fun, you know, dealings with, yeah. with different people and different characters in New Jersey, which is where I was from. So it was really interesting. So, like, oh my God, that guy. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, and then, and then obviously the world changed after 9-11. So uh, we became uh, a different organization. Interestingly enough, pre-9-11, the agents that weren't, the broken and misfit toys of the FBI's agent population right. were sent to terrorism. Okay. So is it any wonder why those buildings went down? Right. Not really. Um, afterwards, the more... I think experienced and and more worldly experienced agents went into the terrorism role. Right. Um, whether that be our time, you know, traveling a little bit to to take a look at what was still in existence out there in the world, or just kind of getting a sense for where you were. So I spent more time in D.C. Spent more time in New York. I spent some time in Texas. I spent some time in in California. Spent some time, you know. Out of the country. So, uh, one, I, I told you I wrote a that uh, Robert Mueller um, prosecuted one of my my buddy. Right? I think you did. Yeah, you yeah. did say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Um, and so, before you leave, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you his book. Okay. I actually have a book on him, and I have a an abridgment. So I'll give you both. Okay. Like the book, the true crime book, is like. What happened, and the, and the prosecution's a part of it. You know what I'm mm, saying? But yes. the, the abridgment is basically, you know, eighty percent of it is the prosecution, like twenty okay. percent the setup, and then the prosecution. Whereas the book, it's probably more like sixty percent what ha- was happening with him. You yeah, know? and then probably forty percent the prosecution. So, okay. but uh, yeah, but you you know, I don't know if you're a big reader or not, but yeah, love it. I mean. It's, it's pretty. I, I think the actual book is is more fun because I don't find the prosecution all that amazing. But mm-hmm. the documentation that I have mm. is just over the top, mm. it, amazing. Um, and there's so much documentation. I actually have a website uh, dedicated to it that where you can actually go. Anybody who's like, "Oh, that doesn't make sense." Okay, well, here I'll show you the document. You yeah. go to this website, you'll find it. Yeah, boom. Here it is. Mm. Exhibit twelve seventeen. You know, boom, mm. right there. And you can read the transcripts. It's it's insane. Um, Awesome. But uh, I was gonna say, why, why, why are you say they sent these guys like the the misfit toy? Like, was it because the bureau at that time didn't feel like like terrorism was a? a that's like, exactly they right. They felt pretty insulated. That's, like, we're pretty good. Here. That's exactly right. You okay. know, if you think about even like even the mindset pre nine eleven, um, and and there were obviously hijackings that happened around right. the world, but none of them. You might have had a couple. I know there was the one where you had a couple of um, that one Navy. 
enlisted guy was shot and killed and dumped out the side of the plane. Right. The pilot had, you know, gun hold to his head. All those things that happened, it never well, ended in anything that looked like well, that. I was going to say, even, you know? even when they tried to take the the World Trade Center down the first time. Yeah, they blew, like, boom, hey, yeah. You, you had, everything went their way. Exactly. It yep. shook the building. Yep. Rocked exactly. it a little bit. Like, exactly. Like, yeah, we're good. Yep, we're Suckers, good. Suckers, even when everything goes their way, they can't, they can't do anything real damage. And that's exactly right. You know, and you think about uh, the memo. Right, so the famous the famous memo, the now famous mem- memo that was written and given to a, a boss in New York, uh, was, what was there's it? there's there's Middle Eastern men of war fighting age who are going to flight school and they're not interested in taking oh, off yeah, or landing. Yeah, yeah. Right, they just want to know how to fly the plane. And this dude, who I know, wrote sixty five page memo that outlined all the reasons why he thought that wasn't really fantastic, and he popped it into a file, you know, a, a terrorism-based file, but he also presented it to several of the upper management guys in New York, and they just were like, ah, you know, I, we don't really see anything there. You know, you know so, what's, what's fucked up about that is that, to me, that's the kind of guy you go to, and you promote him, and you push him, and you help him along his career, but, but what typically happens is you made us look bad, and they actually fucking punish you. Absolutely, and that's exactly what happened to him. And and it became it was just part of the the, the mindset at the time was like, eh, you know what, another terrorism fucking unhappy, right. you know. Well, I'm uh, saying even after 9-11, you, yeah, you would think, hey, oh my God, get this guy great in job. here. Let's great job. Yeah. You're amazing. Yep. Get your, put him in this position. He's no. That's typically, it. they're like, no, they jerk him around, and run man. him out, and that's exactly yeah. what happened. Don't make us look bad. You know, there was other things. There were other documents that talked about that. There were other things that happened. Before, leading up to, I mean, if, you know, you watch The Looming Tower, you watch John O'Neill, who I knew personally, great guy. They destroy him in there, his personality, who he was. That's not who he was in any way. You know, make him look like he couldn't keep his his money in his pocket. You know, he's spending bureau money illegally. He was running around womanizing and booze. Not, not, you know, not the case. Not you know, the case. You know what bothers me about that is that even if that's true. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's so like what? Saying, he was on top it, of the world. Right. He was it, doing what he was supposed to be doing. It's like a, a prostitute seeing a, a murder. You yeah. know, oh, she's a prostitute. She's this, she's that. Did, she does murder. that mean she didn't see the murder? Mm-hmm. Does that mean she wasn't there? That's does that right. mean, like, look, nobody's perfect. You're, you're going to be able to tear apart anybody. And it's sometimes it's worse. If you, it's, a, it's a one guy that you can't find anything on, mm. that's the guy that 10 years later you find, up, find out he's got four sex slaves chained up in the Without basement. Without a doubt. Like, I, I'd exactly rather know up front, like, okay, he's got some issues. Here's his issues. Great. Yeah. Let's compartmentalize those. He's great at this. Let's run forward. Let's yep. move forward. And they made him look broken so that his interaction with agencies, interaction with national security, NSA, looked like he was crazy, right? So they had to come up with a justification for why those relationships were poor. Well, it was crazy John O'Neill. Right. You know, spending too much money, spending, you know, possibly being on the take is the way, they, you know, being a womanizer None, none of that was true. But even if it were, it had nothing to do with why people weren't talking, right? You know why people weren't discussing issues like that together because it was a, an ego trip. So you know, so you were at Gu- Guantanamo. Guan- yes, yes. Yeah, so How, can you say it? Uh, Guantanamo. Guantanamo. Yeah. Okay. One of my best buddies was in charge of the operation there. So one of my West Point buddies, right. who then became an agent, and I would go down to help. Okay. Um, and interesting work, you know, interesting work. I mean, the uh, interrogation by in and of itself is just interesting work. You know, it's a lot of mirroring. It's a lot of just minimizing. It's a lot of- Waterboarding? Uh, meh, not so much. <laughs> not more, so much. Is that, that's more, that's- Boost, better is, that, is that Bustamante's- there, uh, There's some better <laughs> techniques. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I was going to say, like, you start torturing me, I'm going to say whatever you want me to say. Like, that That doesn't, I would think any, any interrogator would be like, look, you're going to- you're, you're going to get way better results this way. These guys are going to start saying anything to get out of this situation if you're torturing someone. You That's know? right. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, I think for me, I go back to my army times, you know, some of the things that were um, a little bit more um, quickly responsive. Right. Uh, you know, the collarbone is a famous one. And I've talked about this before. <laughs> what and it? I got a great story about the collarbone after. But... Um, so when I was, I was a terrible high school wrestler, like terrible, but I would cheat. So if I needed to try to turn a guy on his back, I'd grab his collar, I'd grab right here. Right. And it hurts and yeah. you could break it. So most guys would roll over and then they would 
beat the shit out of me in the second and third period, but at least I got them on their back for a moment. That was the greatest greatest 500 wrestler in New Jersey high school wrestling history, you know, and uh, they all ended the same way, either me getting thrown or by some miracle I threw them. So I, I utilized that down the line, realizing that that's a lot of pressure and you can actually do some damage. Right. You can actually break it and it hurts and you can play with it a little bit like a tooth. That's the most and broken bo- uh, bone in your Most body broken bone and the most painful, they say. I've never broken one, thank God. I, I haven't broken my own. I've right. broken other people. So we utilize that in the military a little bit because it's it's you know it's humane for lack of a better term. You're not right. you're not you know pulling somebody's teeth or or cutting them or doing some of those other things. So that that's one of the techniques that I always kind of went back to, and I may or may not have carried that over into the bureau. Um, right. So funny story, but and it works. I, I mean, it gets say, immediate response. It's long lasting. Right. So I can keep it open. It bleeds a little bit, and it you could pull it out of the skin. See, so, to me, like you bring me like good. some apple pie and, and a, a right. fountain soda, and you know that I'm gonna tell you whatever you want. And to you know. see let's that just, from let's people. Talk. You see that from people. You know that right away. But some of these guys are not like that. The first thing I want to tell you is that, hey, I, I'm I'm gonna kill you. Right. And you're like, well, you're never gonna get out of where right. you are. But thank you though. Thank you so much. You know, I appreciate. Um, that. Yeah, we appreciate the. Yep, let, let me let's, break that collarbone. I, let's, and, let's go straight yeah. to it. Yeah. So, so the best story about this is uh, I'm, I'm at a lunch with one of my high school buddies. There's a bunch of local police officers, and he says, hey, you guys, same thing. You guys waterboard? I'm like, we really don't. You know, we, we, we more do. And I tell him about the collarbone. And he goes, oh, shit, I remember you doing that in high school. I'm like, yeah. And he said, you did it to me. Like, you were fooling around with me one time. It hurt like hell. So we start talking, and I tell him, hey, here's why. Here's what it does. Here's how, the results and whatever. So he says, oh, you know what? And this guy's one of those guys, Keith Frankel. He's a really good dude. He's one of these guys that he knows four or five famous people because he did QVC. He made his money QVC selling supplements to the stars. Okay. So he's done like all the Kim Kardashian shit. He's done uh, Sylvester Stallone stuff. Any famous person who has brought a supplement to the market has gone through Keith, who's gotten through his company, um, uh, VitaQuest, it's called. It's up in northern New Jersey. And Keith's an interesting bird. So he says, you know, um, Stallone's filming Last Blood, the last version of uh, his R- Rambo series. Rambo series. Yeah. He said, you know, he he was just asking for like a technique. They filmed something and he didn't like it. And I said, okay, no problem. He goes, I'm going to have him call you. And I'm like, bullshit. You know, but, but I didn't say anything. I said, sure, anytime. So I'm driving home like probably a week later. And Keith's like, hey, Jim. he calls me like three or four times, Keith. And I'm like, I, I, said, to, I said to my wife, I'm like, I don't really want to. I don't want to talk to Keith. Like, it's too late. You know, he's drunk and or whatever, but I love him. So I said, I got to pick this up. There might be an emergency. So I pick it up. He goes, hey, I got somebody here. They want to talk to you uh, about what we were talking about, that whole collarbone thing. So I'm like, okay, okay. And he's like, you'll know who it is. All of a sudden, on comes, hey, Jimmy. You know, I'm like, right. oh, my God. I didn't know what to say. So I said, hey, I, I loved you and Rocky. He's like, oh, thank you. It was a terrible line. But I'm like, I really loved you and Rocky. So he says, tell me about it. So we talked for like 20 minutes. Right. And I explained the whole thing to him. This is what it would do. I said, what did you do? What's the scene look like now? And he said, well, what it is is my stepdaughter is missing, and I need to find out where she is. She got taken over the border into Mexico, and I want to make somebody tell me what you know, where she is. And I said, well, what do you, what did you film? He said, well, we filmed like cutting his ear off. And I said, well, that's not going to really, it's going to bleed a lot, but it's not going to cause any pain. So if you want to be realistic, do this collarbone thing. Well, he took it to a new level, but it's in the movie. And he basically takes, he takes his combat knife. He breaks the collarbone. He pulls it out and he's playing with it. And then he stabs the guy in the, in the leg too. We got, we got to do, listen, we have to do a short with the scene. Yes. Come on. So it, it's a great scene, and he the guy gives up the information. So I thought to myself, man, that that's Just now hell. out there. Right. And it was it was a very it's a very effective if it were to have happened overseas somewhere, it's a very effective method. Did you tell uh Stallone I'll send you an invoice? 
I did not. I, I you know, I thought about that. I was promised not by not by him, but Keith. Oh, when when it premieres, please, you'll be invited. And oh. I'm like, that never that never happened. Okay. And then he's like, oh, he wants to go out to dinner. That never happened. So whatever. But it was fun. The the 20 minutes of talking to Sylvester yeah, yeah. Stallone, who's a really he's a nice guy, and he he said, you know, I don't have a lot of friends. So he's I said, oh, he goes, that's why I'm friends with Keith. Right. <laughs> the bar is low. Yeah. So that I think that's that like techniques. So and, and really, you're looking to get information from people that they really don't want to tell you at all. It's the one thing that we all have that holy shit. You know, if I got if somebody found this out, I got a problem. Right. Um. In many ways, you know, it could destroy my life in many ways. So I think that's the that's the critical portion of interrogation, and that's something that Quantico did a really good job teaching. And then however you decided to develop that, it fit into my narrative because of the military. I was like, oh, wow, okay, that's something additional that I can kind of use in order to get people to kind of respond in a different way. Um, you know, one of the best ones I think I ever had was very few words. It was with a serial bank robber uh, out of New Jersey. He had done a bunch of cases, and we had caught him um, in, a, in a small Jersey Shore town, uh, and we, we had him in the, in the police – department and right. it, it was like a whole it was a whole thing it was getting more violent um he was a little bit crazy you know he had shot some people up in north jersey um anyway he's sitting in there and he's just just a large african-american dude and he's like ain't he ain't gonna talk so they were going at him you know local police was doing a great job they were trying to go at him like you know chronologically like where were you and the guy's just like i you know i'm not talking you know right. like the same thing and never said never Engaged an attorney, but he's like, I just don't have time. You know, I didn't do anything. You guys have no proof, whatever. So I said, let me just let me I have a like, shot. What I feel like you walk in, sit down, <laughs> stare at the guy for 30 seconds. He goes, okay, listen, man. No, 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 <laughs> no. It was about three and a half hours. Oh, okay. So we walk in there and, you know, just kind of sit down. And he's like, are you an attorney? So I'm like, I'm not. You know, so he says, well, what are, you, what are you doing here? So I said, nothing. I'm just watching. I have to watch you, you know. And I just, everything he did, I did. Like if he went, if he if he nodded, or he put his shoulders up, I would just be like, you know, and just annoying the shit out. I annoyed the shit out of him. Finally, he said, "What do I need to do to get the fuck out of here?" Right. I said, "Did you do this thing in Manasquan? Did you do the bank over here?" He said, "Yeah." I said, "Any others?" He said, "No." So I said, "All right, he's you got you got one." And right. They, and next thing you know, within they they picked it up and did a better job. You know, and down the line, they got four or five more jobs. But it was just basically just having the patience to not say a fucking thing, just to sit and stare at this dude, you know? It's like, yeah, are you an attorney? No. Okay. Some people. Like, he just wanted out. So he's like, whatever. Yeah, I did it. You know, um, I did what I did. Get me out of this little room. Get me out of the room. Yeah. I got to get out. I send, can't. I'm, I'm freaking out. Send me to prison so I can walk the yard, hang out with the guy. And that's what he did. Yeah. And it was a violent, it wound up being a violent guy. I mean, he did some. Did some shootings based on bank robberies up in up North Jersey, and um, you know, it just kind of made sense. So I think those things. I, I I gained patience as I got a little bit older, as I had my army time kind of went away, and then the bureau time kicked in. I felt like I I definitely got more patient with my interrogation work, I mean, and that's key. Uh, you know what's fucked up about the bank robbers is that I don't think that the guys that go in with a gun. And scare the crap out of everybody, and put everybody on the ground. And do. I don't think they get any more money than the guy that walks in with the note. And yep. even if they do, the 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 you know the um, the guy that walks in and gives them the note can do nine banks, 10, 15 banks with a note and get three years. Yeah. The guy that walks in with a gun, and put, you're yep. getting 15 years. If you do one bank, you brand, yep. like you're, you're done. You put that gun out, it's over. It's over, right. So it doesn't matter if you use it or if it's fake or, or real. Yeah, I was going to say, or, well, it wasn't even fake. You might as well have brought, you might as well have brought a real one because you you're go. getting charged with it. Absolutely. So. We had a dude throw a gr fake grenade around his neck. Yeah, that's a bad And that's he a bad just situation. like walked in and was like, if you don't give me money, I'm going to let this loose. Probably thought he was, was very clever. Yeah. And he's like, it's not a gun. Yeah. It's not a gun. Yeah, they don't that's what care. he said. Like, it's not a gun. It's what, yeah, don't you get, don't. Well, I would have killed myself too. <laughs> but it was fake. So <laughs> it matter. No, you wouldn't. If you really were going to do that, you would have pulled the pin on a real job. But you pulled the pin on a 26-year-old girl at oh. a local bank and scared, you know, scared her to literally almost yeah. scared her to death. Yeah. 
and you're don't you're not thinking that you have exposure just like if you carried a gun in because they these guys figure it out they know you know okay don't bring this do a note just like you said you get the money you get four or five thousand dollars you don't get any die pack shit because it's not that much money it's in the drawer and you, you know you're not asking for the entire drawer or the entire bank you're in and out you make yeah. your money you get out of there some dudes are caught we i mean the local pds they'll catch they, they've kept caught guys like on their way out of the bed like to go home after they rob it, they go home to buy the kid something, something the kid needed with right. thirteen hundred bucks. Yeah, and they just put them in the car and be like, "Okay, yeah." I I, I had a, a buddy in um, this guy would be great on the podcast. He mm. was nonstop. I mean, annoying to a, after a while, but for probably two hours, he'd be hilarious. Mm. Uh, and what he, drug addict, like heroin. And one day he's sitting at a counter at like a Starbucks or Star something. It's like one of the counties, you know, it's a counter that was all windows mm. and you're looking out of the street. And I noticed that there's a bank on over on the corner. He said, I'm sitting there and I'm drinking. I'm thinking I'm about to be evicted. I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm getting sick. I need heroin. I don't have any money. My girlfriend has left me. My, like he's just going through everything. And he thought, I think I can rob that bank. He's like, there's no guard in that bank. Like, there's no, there's nobody. And he said, a little tiny bank. And he said, I sat there for a minute. I went, now nah, they'll recognize me. He said, they'll get me on the cameras. He goes, a baseball cap. And he said, so I thought, that's what I need, a baseball cap. He goes, I had about 10, 15 bucks. He said, so I go and I walk across the street to like, <laughs> to like get a 7-Eleven. Yeah. Gets a baseball cap, walks down the street. But has another shirt on or something. Walks and he's like, kind of push the door open so I don't touch anything. Walk over, give her a note. He's I knew not to threaten her. Mm -hmm. So I just said, give me the money and everything will be okay. Mm -hmm. He was, and she took the note and read it and went to take it. And I went, no. And and he said, he said, come on. And she was like, okay. She gave him, I forget, it was, it, he got like, like, you know, I was sort of the average bank robber gets about 3,500 bucks and he yeah. got like 3,500 bucks. Yeah. You know, he, he got yeah. about that. And, she gave it to him, and she and she she said something like, "Do you want me to go in the other drawer?" He was thinking. He said, "I I thought I bet you there's like something in that drawer." Like he's like, "No." He's like, "He's like it looked to me like a lot of money mm -hmm. that she just gave me." He's mm -hmm. like, "So give me the money." I was like, "Nope." Put it in my in my pocket. Turn around. Walked out the door. Fine. He said. Two weeks later, went back to the same Starbucks, sat there and thought, "I bet I could rob that bank again." <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. Right back, back in. in. Robbed yeah. it again. Same technique. Then he um, robbed another bank. So he robbed three banks. <laughs> robbed another, same thing, note, but turns out that in the second bank, same bank, but the second time he robbed it, when he walked out, he pushed the door. He said, mm. he, he said, you know, there was a handle, yeah. but I touched with my fingers, touched the hand, but I also touched the thing. Mm. He said, they caught it on the camera. They dusted it. They had my fingerprints. Mm. He said- they ran the fingerprints because he had been arrested for DUI or yeah. something in Florida. Now he was in like Iowa or something. It was like in the middle of, you know, like yeah. not in Florida. So anyway, when that money ran out, he ended up going back to Florida, got clean, started selling uh, cars again, which is what he was a car salesman. Started selling cars. And he said, one day I'm driving down the road. I get pulled over to speeding or something. No big deal. Cop runs my, uh, you know, runs his uh, tag. Uh, you know, runs his name, comes back, says, hey, can you get out of the car? He's like, uh, yeah, yeah, I can. He said, get out of the car. He said, as I'm getting out of the car, he's like, a, another cop pulls up, another one. I thought, well, this isn't good. He said, I mean, I feel like I've 100. <laughs> he said, it's been, it's been fucking years. Like, yeah. I got away with it. Yeah. They, he was, he was, I, he was, they go, look, I'm going to put some cuffs on him. He's like, yeah, he's like, real polite guy. Yeah. <laughs> he's yeah. like, yeah, I cuff no him. He yeah. cuffs him up. He's yeah. like, boom. And the guy goes, yeah, there's a warrant out for your arrest. He said, for bank robbery in such, in like, whatever, wherever it was, Iowa or something. He's like, oh, oh damn it. It's the, one, it's the one he touched. Yeah, buddy. Yeah. And they had it. Yeah. The FBI it's comes amazing. In. Yeah. He, yeah. Said, they came in. They said, look, we got you for, we got you for this one. We, we believe you also this one. We got you on this one or this one. We have another one we think you might have done he's like yeah i did that one he, mm. said, he said you know if you just tell us you did this like make this go quick he said look you're probably going to end up with i don't know he said it's up to the u.s attorney but we'll they consolidate him you don't have a bad history you're probably going to end up with about three years and so yeah right yeah he didn't yep. threaten yep. anybody yep. nobody was yep. scared nobody was yep. you know yep um but yeah as opposed to somebody who goes shooting it up yeah it's like you're getting 
You're getting 10 years. You just show the gun, you're getting 10 years. 10 years. You yep. pull, if you fire it, oh, yep. my God, oh, if you fire it. the gun. Forget it. I knew a guy that uh, he and his buddy robbed robbed the store, uh, robbed the bank on campus. Mm. This is they were high school. I mean, they were college kids. Robbed it, and and I'm sure you've got about ten thousand of these. But this is funny though, because this one always killed me because I was in prison when he told me the story. And we're sitting in our cell, and he said I uh, pulled out the gun. No, he didn't. They both had like BB guns, mm. like but they, they looked real, bro. Yeah. So we as we pulled them out, and we're like, get on the ground, get on the ground. He said, but I know it's a BB gun. Yeah. He's like, my buddy knows it's a BB gun too, but he's more of an idiot than I am. And he said, he screams, get on the ground, get on the ground. And he said, people are starting to hunch down, but they're not yeah. really getting on the ground. Yeah. And they don't seem as scared. Like they're kind of like, I yeah. Don't know. Yeah. What's going on? Yeah. He said, one guy goes, get on the ground. And he fires the BB gun. It ricochets off the ceiling, the wall, of the ceiling, and hits a woman in the, in, in, in the cav. It's a BB. And it's ricocheted. There's got no, it's really no, just, no juice. Nothing. Yeah. But he said, but it stung her. He's like, you should see the photos. He's like, it's a little welt. Yeah. He's like, she goes, I'm hit. <laughs> and she falls on the ground. He said, we, he's like, I was so scared. He's, we turned around and we ran. I go, you didn't get the money? He's like, no, I didn't get the money. I was so terrified. Oh my God. He's like, he goes, I thought, oh my God, you shot Be- somebody. BB'd off, ricocheted he's, a BB into yeah. her calf. He said, I'm running. Holy shit. They're that's running so, away. That's so good. <laughs> they're running away. He said, I'm thinking to myself, how did you shoot her? Yeah. Like, yeah. What did it, one, why did you pull the trigger? And two, she couldn't have been shot. And he was like, did the BB hit her? Like, and he's like, you know, it doesn't sound like a gun. No, and no, it's like a like an air pop. Hilarious. But charged with a Hell gun. Yeah, because charged got, with absolutely. Yeah. You know, I'm sure he rolled on his buddy. I think he still ended up with like 10 years. But damn. That's hey, by the way, he shaved time. his head. This is what's hilarious. He said, yeah. super smart guy. Yeah. Went straight home. Shaved went, the head. Shaved his head yep. really good while listening to the police. Yeah. What do you think is his? What do you think his um his roommate thought when he so my roommate comes in? He's like, man, I, I you hear those cops? Yeah, something's going on. He's like, yeah, I don't know, man, I don't know. He's like, he's I've never shaved my head before. <laughs> he's like, what well, you shaving? Really shaved my head, man. He's like, no. Yeah. Every, he's everybody. As soon as I go back to school, everybody immediately knows there was a robbery. Your head is shaved, like, <laughs> like it's you, bro. There's pictures yeah. of this person. Yeah, we're looking for. Holy cow! How old? So he was a college kid at the time. Yeah, he was a college kid. Holy shit! I mean, he was probably 25 or Unbelie- something like that. Unbelievable. Uh, in Coleman, he'd been locked up a while. Damn. That's I tell you, stupid. like some some of those stories. And the bureau now is it's got no not, money. No, the they don't get even, any money for the amount no, of money that you end up getting. No, in a that's bank why robber. it's become less of an. Like it's not even a crime issue for the bureau. Like we don't even work that stuff anymore. Right. Just like organized crime. You know, the mafia went away. Yeah. Supposedly. Yeah. Ah, we're gonna stop. You know, I'm like <laughs> these guys are having a field day. <laughs> well, we're not, you know. It's like I always tell the story of the summer before and it summer the sharks just came back again this year. But before nine eleven, there were the the reports were that sharks were just fucking eating people up here in Florida. It was pretty it was true, it was happening. Right. Summer of two thousand one. And all of a sudden nine eleven hits. Yeah. And there's much. the sharks just don't bite anymore. So the sharks are like, you know, those people are going through a lot. Let's just not fucking bite, you know? And it's like amazing. It, it's absolutely amazing when you think about that kind of shit. Yeah. It's nuts. No, you know, you, it's, it's, it's whatever they want. And same they, thing with Bureau. A, agenda they want to yeah, push. that's the way the Bureau manages stuff. Like, eh, the, the mafia, the, they're not really doing the same stuff. Nobody, you know, they flip on each other. So even if we get a case, we'll get it quickly resolved. That That is not that is not the truth. You still have your old school guys yeah. that do stuff, you know, all the time. And, I mean, it's pretty funny to – my neighborhood, you know, where I live now, right now, we've got a couple of old school – you know, old school mobsters that right. live around there, and they—I recognize them. They recognize me. I was at—I went to—I went How's to that a walk um, in your dog. Oh, dude! It's like, hey, what's Tony? going on? What's going on, Jim. Tino? How you been? Um, we had—we had. We had uh, I just had. I, I was in two things. I was in New York City at a Broadway play this past week, and I sit down in my seat and I look over, and one guy's like, like <laughs> my girlfriend says. <laughs> You know that guy. I'm like, yeah. You know, I put that guy away. You know, and he he wants to come over. I'm like, stay over there. For now. Why? Like, yeah. No. Then this afterwards, is... at, at, I, okay. I met him afterwards. I'm like, don't, don't crawl over people to come see me. <laughs> Second one is I go to the Bahamas, get off the flight. We're waiting to go through to get passport check or whatever it is when you get in. And there, there's a guy. He's like, Jimmy, I just got out. I'm like Johnny Balls. He's like, yeah. Johnny he goes, thank Balls. you for being so nice and. I said, remember my wife? I'm like, yeah, we all stared at her ass all the way up the stairs, you know, and you got mad. He goes, exactly. 
I still get mad. <laughs> and he just like, and so like the people I was with, they're like, holy shit. Like, it's, can we go, we it's can't go Sam anywhere. She- it's Sam the sheepdog. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and the, the coyote, right? Yes, like it's exactly. You know, it's just funny. I mean, like you, and, and a lot of my, a lot of guys who have become really good friends are guys that I locked up. Right. That, you know, turn their life around. Right. And it's pretty cool. Hold you on. know, it's pretty cool to watch it. Hold on. Yeah. Do you know who Sam the sheepdog and the coyote are? I knew it. Disgusting. <laughs> okay. That's, um, but yeah, I mean, it's 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 kind of an amazing, amazing piece to kind of see you know see folks around, see them turn their life around, you know, to, to do their thing. Right. So you know, good eh. stuff, man. Yeah, you've done great. Eh, it's still early. Um, so let's <laughs> see how let's see for how me, this YouTube for me thing. too for me too. So oh. so what what happens after after you come back from Cuba? Mm-hmm. Right. Yep. And and that was off and on. You know, oh, okay. Cuba was like back and forth at a particular, you know, particular times when I was needed, per se. Right. Um. So that, so then I start kind of a little bit of a rise in the bureau. So what I kind of did a little bit like, of promotions. What and, I feel like that phone call is, hey, we need you to come to uh, Guantanamo. And you go, does he have two good collarbones? Still got the collar. He's still, still intact. Okay, I'm on my way. I feel like. But Has he been I'm, damaged before in the collarbone area? Okay, I'll be right down. Yeah, I was a specialist uh, for sure. But yeah, and and then just you know your norm your normal kind of um, your normal bureau rise right. um, with some other interesting portions of my career. Okay, which were spent you know on several week deployments. I'll call them doing very specific um, you know kind of missions based on my past. None of that sounds good. Yeah. So based on my military experience, um, doing you know, some things that we do, you know, that we do. Um, I don't feel like you're, you're, I feel like you're dancing around something. I'm, dan- I'm definitely dancing. You're not going to tell me? Yeah, I'm definitely dancing around. Not yet. Okay. Yes, at some so, point. Okay. Down the line. All right. Off camera. Off camera. Um, yeah, for sure. So what was the next interesting case? Um, so I've had a lot, a lot of my stuff, um, a lot of my leader stuff was based on uh, the interrogation portions that I had worked on. Right. So it became like a development of a case. So uh, and and passed along to our our brethren um, like Mr. Bustamante uh, and the like, or worked together with those folks. So I did a lot of time caking that, uh, gathering the information and the and the intel side. So so that's the beauty of what happened. It's not the beauty. This sounds terrible. But after nine eleven, I think it became evident to us one-on-one it was no longer cia versus fbi or this one versus that one right it was it was now do i do i relate to you andy or do i relate to you edwin or do i relate to you bill um you know or or danny like how how do i relate what i want to actually work something with you and i want to take my skills which are investigative purely um and your skills which are basically asset and intel and source development mm-hmm. and bring them together to to run a case right to run it out i think that was a big portion of what i was doing for those last 10 years of my career so what were short the management I, mean, I can't that's the problem i know my god i know that's the problem um there's i don't not have you here for your personality i know well uh, kind of you do uh, <laughs> so do. but some of those things are still sealed off you know mm. so um interestingly enough uh, i think the big the big portion for me was what we're doing today together right uh, is is really a um a beautiful kind of metamorphosis of what we did back then so together real, so i don't forget yeah we interviewed an fbi agent mm-hmm. um I interviewed it. Colby just sat there. He didn't. He didn't contribute at all. Um, so he was. He retired after twenty five years because he went in the FBI at twenty five. Yeah. Correct? So he got out of fifty. Yeah. Because he had his twenty five in. Yeah. Yeah. That's a that's a great yeah that's a great move. And he um, he started a um, and what is it PI service PI service mm. that's what he said right. So he started that and started TikTok, which cracks me up. Wait, what's uh? I, I think I've seen him on. The- yeah, he's he's really good. I, I interviewed him. Uh, we just released it like a. Um, I want to say Greg or Tom or something like that. Yeah, I think I, Tom Tom. Yeah, Simon. I just saw I just saw a TikTok of his. It was really good. So here's what he here just just so that you and he kind of consults a little bit, right? On, right? You and Bustamante understand. So his strength, which I, I don't see this in you or Bustamante, is um, he 
basically worked for fraud uh, fraud accounting. So he would go in and do the forensic analysis yes. of the books. Yes. Um, you know, of course, he arrests people. He interviews them. He does the whole thing. But he would go in. He's like, and he does that for companies to this day. That's huge. And he comes in. And he's like, they're like, we got an issue. Yeah. And then they look over everything. And then he pinpoints a couple of employees. He has a talk with them. He said, typically, they'll break down and say, oh, my gosh, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And he'll go, okay. He'll write up a report. He sends it to the FBI. He said, yeah. no, they usually, he said, they usually act on it because I've written an entire FBI file for them. Yeah. And they've all, I've got everything laid out. He's so, doing a criminal referral, basically, right. for, for, you know, for a client. I mean, so um, that's somebody. So if you guys, I'd have love to kinda... because I think that makes sense. We we need subject matter experts like that, right? Yeah. So we, Andy and I are the forward facing portion of this thing. Like, right. hey, meeting clients, meeting potential clients, you know, getting out, doing these events on the weekends and those things. I think a guy like that could really add value. So yeah, yeah I'd love to get intro to him. He's he's um, in um, Jacksonville. You know what's funny about him? Oh, so he's right. Yeah, he's right where we're, we're kind of headquartered. The the night before he came, he said, "Hey, listen." I noticed that you wore a black shirt in the last couple of interviews. And I went, no, oh, wait. Sorry, I think it was um, Gene. He goes, I noticed you wore a black shirt in a couple of interviews. He yeah. goes, I noticed you and the other guy, uh, you and another guy both wore black shirts. Mm. And I said, right. He said, you want me to wear a black shirt? I went, well, I don't usually color coordinate. I'm, I, yeah. I, said, I said, it was a coincidence. I said, but yeah, sure, if you want. Yeah. I said, I can, I can wear whatever black shirt you want. I'll match up to it. I said, sure, fine. And he goes, okay, sounds like a good idea, which I thought was hilarious because nobody's ever asked that. Yeah. And so then he shows up. We're both wearing a black shirt. And I said, you understand that? I said, in the comment sections, people are going to roast us. Oh, hell yeah. And they were just, people in the comment sections were just like, what's oh, up with the black shirt? Fucking how cute. cute. <laughs> well, then do. I won't do that. I won't show up. I got a black shirt. No. Um, so, but yeah. it was, uh, but yeah, he's 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 an interesting I would love guy. to meet that guy. Yeah, because yeah, that's a huge portion and, of it. You and know? you can listen to his 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 thing and yeah. that would help me out. Yeah. Because you know, you know 100%. listen listen to the uh, ads. Um definitely. definitely. But he's yeah, he's you can tell he's and he's worked a bunch of big cases, right? Like he had a bunch of big cases that well, he was a part of. Especially in Florida, of. man. Probably a lot of healthcare stuff, I when would it, think. Well, no, he was also oh, was he all over the place. Yeah, yeah. He he was in Hawaii, yeah. he was in Chicago Chicago. Chicago. Okay. Yep. You know, Chicago, yep. Hawaii. Um, I think he retired to Florida. I forget the other place he was at. Um, but yeah, there were several cases where he was he explains the whole case. He's like, I was not lead on that case. I was this. And you know, he starts like he he was always very specific about explaining his role. Like I yeah. was on the team, but you have to understand that the lead guy was, and he kind of breaks it down. He's yeah. like, but I worked on this portion. Yeah. Because at some point you have to say, we don't know what this is. Yep. And then he comes back and he says, okay, they're laundering money through this. Yep. Here's what they're yeah, doing. Yeah, here's what they're doing. No, that'd be that'd be fantastic because a lot of the work that we do now. Uh, we, what's funny is he was saying like on his, the PI uh, part, he's like, you know, the problem is he's like, what I love to do, which is like the forensic analysis kind of stuff. He said, you don't get a ton of that. He said, and a lot of times it's frustrating because once you go into the company mm. and you do the forensic analysis and you come back and you say, listen, this is what's happening. This is what's happening. This is how, how they're doing it. They're like, okay, thanks. He's like, okay, um, I can contact you know the FBI. I can, and they're yeah. like, no, no. Yeah, we're going to handle it. In yeah, house. and it's like, well, so nothing's going to go down. Fraud. Hey, they, they're embarrassed a lot well, of, of course. Time. You, you know what I'm thinking too? Part of, part of what we do, meaning... Uh, everyday spy, you know, right. meaning Andy's company with me now as a subject matter expert guy, which is right. awesome. Um, so getting a chance to do a lot of, you know, co-hosting and those kinds of things right. with him. Um, red teaming is important. So red, that means. red teaming is awesome. It, it, it's a, it's actually a concept that the army, believe it or not, the army started back probably after 9-11. And so what it is, is going in and showing vulnerabilities to companies. To I think Ford Motor Company did it first. Right. And there were some crazy results based on that red teaming. And um, Boost is taken to another level now. So part of us coming into a company, let's say a client brings us on board, part of, and let's just take this example from Tom Simon, right? So he does forensic accounting. For him to come in and kind of teach or show those people that do the books for those companies or that are CFO level or uh, project management level, hey, here's the things to be looking for, you know? So I'm going to come in and and re what red teaming is, is actually planting information, known information. So, hey, we go to we go to the CEO, we go to whoever is on the team that's going to lead this thing for the company. Listen, we want to infiltrate your company and we're going to do these five things and we want to see how your employees react. 
right? And see who reacts well, see who doesn't react so well. The big thing is we can't. We're not asking you. We don't want you to fire somebody. We don't want you to leave somebody hanging. We want you to to actually be able to train them up based on unless we find something completely criminal. Yeah, yeah. But um, how how can we do that? With you guys, okay. So part of it's forensic, part of it obviously cyber penetrations, part of it is just basic physical security. For me, I did a case. Uh, I my first job ever with the, my new company was with a big financial firm up in New Jersey, up in Hoboken, Jersey City area, right across from the from New York City. Right. And um, they wanted to know how where their vulnerabilities are for the CEO, and it started with a big portion. It started with a totally different thing for him. He had an issue where the board was looking to promote him to CEO, but there were some problems in his, you know, in his background, supposedly, who was planting those problems, who was kind of, uh, you know, telling the truth, who was going to some rag financial uh, papers and leaking this stuff out. None of it was true. We were able to do that, plan it. But now he's like, how do, how do I avoid that shit from happening again? Like, how do I avoid somebody coming? And we had found out that people had been uh, had access to the office, were stealing paintings, were damaging items in his office, doing crazy shit. And this is like a major corporation. Like a, it's like it manages some ridiculous amount of money. It's a, it's a hedge fund. I don't know, a couple couple hundred billion dollars, whatever the hell it is. Right. Fifty four partners, everything else. So what I did the first day was I said, all right, I'm going to just try something. I'm going to see how good your security is downstairs. Right. I went to the Starbucks. You know, I basically put, I, I made sure my weapons were all unloaded. I had my weapons on me. Um, went in, went right up to the security guard who was sitting there, supposed to check your driver's license and sign you in. Just basically said, hey, how, how have you been? You look great. You know, hey, I'm just going up. You know, what it is. Yeah. oh yeah, yeah, go ahead. So I'm like, first step, go into the elevator, right? Hit the button, go up to 11. This is where his, his office is on 11. I walk in, I walk up to the girl, walk kind of past her, and I'm like, how were those bagels I brought in last week? And she's like, oh, my God, they were so good. Whatever. <laughs> Just like crazy, crazy. <laughs> I walk right in, no into his office, open the door, take my weapon out, put it to his head and say, we got a problem. Well, And he just was like, holy shit. And so that's red teaming in a nutshell. And that's a lot of what we do now. Um, incorporated in other skills. I mean, obviously, Andy brings so much more how to how to break barriers in your business and how to get to the next level. But those kinds of things are kind of what I've been brought in to do. Right. The physical security side of the house. You know, how do we take a client and say, here's the way you can protect yourself. Here's the way you can protect your travel, your children. Big portion of it is a lot of people now, especially high net worth, which we work a lot with high net worth, kids going off to college, right? How do they prepare that kid to go off to college and be able to handle, be situationally aware of things that can happen at college. You know, and, and there's a million different things, if you think about it. Everything from getting robbed at the ATM, you know, to freaking somebody posting something about, uh, you know, some reputation management issue for you and your high net worth family. So we, we now go in and say, okay, how can we train these children and train the parents at the same time to make sure that we mitigate that crisis before it even happens. People are going nuts over this because they're like, holy shit, we can give this up to these guys. You got a CIA guy and an FBI guy that are going to train my kid. First off, it's cool. They think it's cool. Yeah, of course. Oh, you know, we'll go. We're gonna hang. Oh, yeah. My God. Everybody thinks that we're their personal person. Yeah. Right? So that's red teaming in a nutshell. Let's set up scenarios for where something could happen. God forbid something serious or something that's just minor with regards to, um, you know, giving information to someone that you shouldn't have given information to or putting stuff on social media or traveling the same way from to and from class when you're when you're a high net worth child and people understand that you maybe can have a little bit of money and maybe I can get some money up. Of, of yours for me right? Uh, based on doing something crazy. So that's red teaming in a nutshell. But then take it to another level. We There's a thousand verticals that you can kind of you gotta business You got to work me that. into this. I you feel know? like I need, to be, I need to be worked into this. Dude, that's why I'm here. I I, I mean- Don't let me break your collarbone. I, I, come on, you're going to come. I mean, there's got to be a financial fraud expert or- Of course there or is. Like, and listen, I would love to. It's funny because we've, you know, I've pitched, I've been pitched- um, scenario type TV shows to be a part of. They, yeah. ne they never happen. You know, it's always, it's three or four meetings with this producer and mm -hmm. that one and a director and this guy. And then it's this, this, this person. And it always ends up it just, just fading off. Yeah. They, and they're all yep. super excited every single time. Yep. But one of the ones I always thought was, would be great is that, you know, you kind of like, you 
present a a fake you know le- fake legend right mm-hmm. like a, a mm-hmm. synthetic identity of some kind you go in and you apply and try and get loans and what can i pass what can i pass what will you guys accept how do i ver- how do you guys verify it? how do i get around that verification yep. and yep. the whole thing of walking in they look at you and they think clean cut white guy yep. right yep um, you know, they're not thinking everything seems to check out, even when there's red flags, they overlook them, you know? So, uh, I always thought that would be, I think that's awesome. I mean, there, there's, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of like, um, there's a market for that because we're getting reached out to by different people that want to do those kinds and, of things. I, I own a financial yeah. institution. I, I own know. a mortgage company for like I, five I years. I totally What's understand. I get it. I should, I'm in, I mean, you should be embarrassed. I just can't believe I had to bring this to you. <laughs> Jeez. No, we're just getting there. It's just starting. So, um, but but yeah, the, the red team is is a valuable tool because it shows you your own vulnerability without exposing it to the rest of the world. So we do that. Now there might be times where a company says, "Yeah, fuck it, see what you can do. Let's film yeah. it." That would be cool if we ever got oh, yeah. to that point. No, oh yeah, that would be cool. Yeah, you I don't mean, mean to film it. I just no, no. Meant, but I mean yeah. that would be. That would be oh, unbelievable. That, that'd be a whole fucking show. Because it's just a win-win. Think you know, that you're going into different companies, but some yeah. companies would be embarrassed. That's some a big companies thing would be embarrassed, companies. and you know, um, but you know, some people and would want their discretion. You know, we get it, um, and we could do that too. But just to be able to show you, like, hey, man, you you guys are totally exposed, and here's the people that are uh, jamming you up. What you happened know? with the prep school? Did you walk into a oh, prep school? Yeah, yeah. But so you, was, you, by the way, one thing you know, I, what I've always heard. Yeah, you can get in anywhere if you're carrying a ladder. Like if you've got you a ladder can. and a definitely, yeah. Guy like, yeah. Hey, where's oh, the yeah. uh, where's yeah, the where's service that, elevator? As long as you know here. where. Yep. As long as you know where you're going and what yeah. you're doing. But that was the same thing for me. Like uh, it was a challenge because I was like, hey, see see how secure my kid's school is. Okay. It's the same thing. So I'm like, what do you mean? Yeah, like you know, see if see if you can get in and talk to my kids. Like it shouldn't be. This is, we pay a ton of money for the school and right. everything else. So I'm like, okay, you know, challenge is a challenge to me. So, I mean, that was, that was it. I mean, I just basically walked up. I walked up to the security guy, I made, made, you know, Hey, where, where were you on the job? You know, what were you doing? And then I threw on, but I had a little fake accent going. Yeah. So I was like, Hey, I just moved up. You know, I moved up from South Carolina. Um, I'm really interested in my kids coming to this school. We just bought a house over here. And I'm hoping that maybe I can get a look around, you know, and uh, I only got like a day. Uh, I got to be back. I'm flying back tomorrow morning. Is there a chance? And at first he's like, no, nah, we, we really don't do that. You know, you got to go through administration. I'm like, man, like I got I got the money to get the kids in here. You know, I just, I just want to see it so I can tell my wife she's all over me. You know, can you please help me get through? And, and next thing you know, he's like, I said, you can walk with me if you want. He's like, you know what? Just Just be quick. Don't take any pictures. You know, so I walked in. I, I knew where the kids. I knew what grades the kids were in. Right. So I walked into each classroom and I took selfies with both his kids. Oh my god! And when I went back, I said, "You cannot have that guy fired. You can have him trained. Yeah, I can train him. And you can't. You know, that's. But this is like, if I could do it, anybody could do it. Yeah, yeah. So you, you got to know that. So we we changed the whole method of the school. Like we changed the whole uh, security kind of outlook and postured it up to another level, which was great, but it wasn't so great because I was like, I felt shitty doing it. Yeah. I was like, oh my God, these kids are like, these are young kids, you know? And they're like, who are, I'm like, I'm your dad's friend, you know? Did well, he talk you, about me? Here's, here's the, here's the problem. It was, I think just people in general. Yeah. When someone meets me, if they just meet me, hey, what's up? We shoot the shit. We talk for 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. If it doesn't come up. Mm-hmm. I don't mention my past. Yeah. Um, If it does come up every, and I mean every single time it comes up, like I never shy away from it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're like, oh yeah, this and this and this. I'm like, oh yeah, I never saw that. And they're like, I can't believe you didn't see that. I'm like, well, I'm like, well, I, when did it come out? And I'm like, well, I was in prison at that point. So Mm. if they didn't show it on the TV, I didn't see it. And they were like, they're like, you, are you joking? You were in prison? And when the, the reactions I get from people are like, bro, I would have never. And then I explain, yeah, yeah, it was this and this and this. Yeah. I did 13 years. They're like, 13 years? You realize peep, average citizens, the same people that set up the school and did everything, the average person has a, they, they have an image and a behavior model of what they think a criminal is. But the truth is, maybe 10, 5 or 10% of criminals fit that. Most exactly. of them 
are con men. Yep. They're, they're, they're psychopaths. They will lie to you. They will cheat. They will, they are manipulative. They will come off. They have a, a, a fun, you know, they have a, a facade that they put on to get over on you. And that goes from bank robbers to kidnappers to Absolutely. drug dealers, even Absolutely. In, in many cases too. A lot of people that you think, Oh, I, I I can tell of a, what a drug dealer is. No, you probably live next to a, a, a very have a no drug idea, dealer, right? right? Exactly. He's probably the guy what that most yard, right? They That's think he's think walking around. He's got tattoos. Yeah, he's got this, but the chains, is, right? And... He's actually super cool. Hey, what's up? Listen, um, um, uh, Boziak. If you just talk to him, like, listen, college graduate, uh, um, great vo- I mean, I mean, great vocabulary. Mm-hmm. Uh, college graduate. Um, uh, uh, I want to say. What am I saying? Uh, vocabulary uh, speaks well. He's charismatic. He's if it weren't for the tattoos, mm-hmm. you know, you would never, never have yeah. any idea. Yep. And and so I think that it's the same thing. Like you're saying, like the people that set up the security for that school and that sort of thing, probably, and even that guard, they probably think they looked at you and thought he's yeah. fine. Yeah. They have an image of what that bad right. guy, that bad guy has got neck tattoos exactly. and a teardrop and he walks up and he doesn't speak good English. And that guy, no, no matter what, you can't walk around. But yep. he looked at you and he thought you I had a suit okay. on, right. you know, no tie, suit, no tie. Like they're like, ah, this guy really put, you know, Listen, I had a little background. The kidnappers, and I've met multiple kidnappers in mm-hmm. prison. Never know. Clean cut. So I was going to say. Nice. Never know. Nice guys. Yeah. Spoke well, everything. It's, it's absolutely the truth. I mean, and that's why I think- even this 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 kind of red teaming right kind of promotion is you want to be safe like even within families like even within high net worth families how do we kind of lock your family down cuz the world's getting crazier by the right. minute so it how is, do we do that more and more polarized yeah how do we do that how do we make sure that you're at least aware you situationally aware like most people just walk around just fucking no idea just yeah. sheep you know like just sheep waiting for the waiting for the dog, sheep dog, to, in, in basically the wolf to just come and I, and, I was, and and take them out. Right, you know it's just crazy, and I see it all the time. I mean, most of our clients are that way. I was gonna say, um, I know a guy. Well, I, mean, I know several kidnappers, but this one guy, so funny. It actually always cracks cracks me up because his name was Killian. His last name was Killian, which I thought was funny. But he couldn't go to he actually. He actually, I think he could go to the halfway house, but he couldn't go. He couldn't be released. On, on an ankle monitor, couldn't go home because he has there's some kind of a, an act that's on him for being da- extremely dangerous. Oh, there's okay. a Hobbs Act or something. I yeah, forget yeah, what yeah. they call it. Okay, yep. But I remember we were talking one time, and I was like, "Oh, they're not going to let you go home." Where, wherever we were, say we were shooting the shit, and I said, "Um, uh, what? How did it come up? The the kidnapping came up, and I said, um, yeah, I said, well, uh, I said, hey, I have a question for you." And I said, the guy that you he owed his his he owed his boss like a hundred thousand dollars, so he mm-hmm. kidnapped him. And I said, uh, and he was part of the like the um, I don't want to say it wasn't it was the Romanian mob. It was I was gonna not Russian. It was Romanian mob. Mm. And, it, and I said, I said, bro, so you kidnapped this guy? You duct taped him to the to the thing? And we're sitting there eating, and, and I would fuck with him all the time. Yeah. And he's just like, oh, God. And I go, what if he didn't come up with the money? And he goes, he goes, they always come up with the money. And I looked at him and I said, well. I said, "What do you mean always? You did this the one time." He goes, "Yeah, yeah, it was just it was just the one <laughs> just time, just the once." And I just like, was really lucky that time. I, I was like, <laughs> lucky "Always, yeah. um, listen, that guy always he come was up with the, the money. He was the nicest guy, but you could see in his face we would be goofing around and joking around, and laughing our ass. Switch. Up. It's a switch. Oh yeah. And it, one minute you'd say that di- that guy wouldn't hurt a flea, and boom." You could look at him Changes and you think, that minute. guy cut your head clean off your body and his heartbeat wouldn't and go not up. Even, yep, right. not even think about it. Yeah. That's the people, special operations community yeah. in a nutshell, too. Yeah. I mean, people that's don't the, know that. They no, don't think it. That's like that's the that's the the paradox of having that in, in the special operations community. Those guys, I mean, the switch just goes off. They're, they have a penchant for violence, and they can go home and drink a drink a cup of coffee with their wife and be like, hey, everything's great, and, and really believe that. That everything's great. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool, but it's pretty crazy when you think about the capabilities that some of these people have and how they do it and what they do you yeah, know, I, in their life. I met a I, I had a, a a bank robber who literally, um, how did he how did he go again? He dropped like thirty banks. He had he picked up his son. 
somehow or another, he picked up his son from school, went and dropped him off at like, I'm probably getting this wrong, but uh, dropped him off at like a um, T-ball practice or something. The kid was young, like four or five years old. Went and robbed the bank, drove back, picked up his son, dropped him off, uh, and, and then uh, brought him home yeah. and went in. And he's like, and I've, I've got the, he said, I've, I've got like the, the money in my pocket. He said, of course, he's, I went through to make sure there's no, there's no tags or no nothing on. He said, I got, yeah. he said, but yeah, he said like, I mean, he's like, I, I remember that at that point I thought, yeah, man, this, yeah, I, this is, it's this crazy. normal. He's like, yeah. he's like, no. I remember, cause I remember telling him like, weren't you, were you worried? Were you this? No, nah, it's fine. He's like, listen, one time this happened. I said, what'd you think? And he goes, I mean, I remember that time I thought, yeah, it's not normal, bro. Like the cops are actually driving around looking yeah. for me. Yep. I got my son in the car. The son, yep. And he's like, I, 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 yeah, yep. he's like, yep. I, I knew that was fucked up. He's yeah. like, yeah. But uh, yeah, I had I, I had another it's crazy, I had man. another bank robber. This guy actually owned a security company. He'd gone to prison, owned a security company. He put in um, Rush Limbaugh's security system, <laughs> and was hooked on crack, and went to go buy like um, a, a friend of his. He went to go buy a um, the guy had like a van. He said, man, I want to buy your van. He's like, yeah. He's like, how much? He's like, I want, I want this much for it. He's like, yeah. How much? He's like, yeah. He's like, I don't quite have enough. He goes, <sighs> you see what he said? Let me see what I can do. He said, Allah. He goes, okay. And so I got my car. I went straight to a bank. I robbed the bank, drove down the street, robbed another bank, counted up the got money, what I had enough, came back. He said, pulled into the to the driveway, he said, "Hey man, can I pick it up right now? Like, we'll switch over the thing, but I need it now. I don't want to drive." He was, and I could. He was, he could hear. I, he could like, hear. I need it right now. Yeah, he's like, he could hear the the cops in the background, and he sat there and he went, "Did you just rob a bank?" And he goes, "Or do you want to do this or what?" I mean, yeah, what, you know, yeah. <laughs> don't like, worry about the detail. Give me the money. Yeah, yeah give yeah, me the yeah. money. <laughs> don't detail the car or ask details. <laughs> Same Holy thing. Shit. The guy's name was. Uh, I remember his name was D. Geronimo. He wasn't Indian. He, although he pretended to be Indian, and there's a whole Indian thing. Mm. Um, his De Geronimo he was actually Italian. Great painter, happened to be a crackhead. Um, not, listen, you looked at this guy. I'm telling you, he looked. You're not thinking he, anything different. He could be Colby. He could be Middle America, a normal, Cold average dog. guy. I think one of the funniest, all time greatest stories is um, just a sweet little councilwoman from a small Monmouth County, New Jersey town, comes to us because she gets this. Um, advertisement in the mail that says, hey, you've won two free uh, grave plots. And okay. she says, I, I'm taking that as I'm as gonna a threat. Die. Oh, they're threatening me <laughs> because <laughs> the person who sent it, the cemetery owner, is someone who's trying to do illegal business in our town. And I know it. So I'm like, okay, would you... By chance, would you be willing to wear a wire? I thought it was a scam. Either, so but, okay. no, it was. It was, it was a threat. It was a scam. Oh, okay. But she took it as that, which let us gave us the opening now to record right. a person that we knew that was predicated to have taken money. They actually called this guy the ten percent person. So kind of like what we've got going on today, what people are calling the president. You know, he gets ten percent of everything or whatever. Right. This guy actually, this small Monmouth County, New Jersey town council person, and then later became a board um, chairman on several of the planning board, zoning board, municipal um, utilities board, those things. This guy was actually a 10% guy. So what happens is we say, would you be willing, would you wear a tape and go talk to this guy and just to see whether or not he's looking to have a meeting with you. That's why he might have sent you right. the ad. Now, we never really connected the ad, but we just saw it as an opportunity because she called the FBI. And um, she said, oh, in my official capacity, you know, it seems to be the threat. So we're like, okay, we, we don't disagree um, with it. Would you go talk to him and see if he's the one who sent it? And then later on, whether or not he wants to talk. So sure than shit, she sets up a meeting. And amongst other things, he talked, he exactly, hey, I'll give you a bunch of money for your next campaign if you approve these four projects that we have. Right. So she listens, okay, and in the course of this, he, he tells this great story. He said, I don't know if you know my background. You know, he's one of these like oh, little God. mobsters. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you know my background, but I was in the horses. And then later on, I was in the dog races. He goes, you know, those things are fixed. Now, this woman is like... You know, she she's high came from a high net worth family, went to yeah. Ivy League schools. She's like, Oh no, I, I I didn't really know that. He says, You wanna know how they fixed the dog races? So she's like, 
uh, yeah, you know, I guess I do. He says, they BJ the dogs. And there's like silence, right? And then all of a sudden he, he just goes to her. How'd you like to have that job? <laughs> to what she basically just, she can't even, she's got to get out of the meeting. Right, yeah, yeah, I was going to say. She's, she's, she's got to get out of the meeting at that point. So she comes back and we're trying to like face up with her, like uh, anything, you know, not telling her that we had a transmitter so we can hear her. Right. Anything interesting? Oh, no, you know, no, nothing at all. I'm just <laughs> on the side of it. He did offer me some money for... You know, if I were to prove some of his, well, that's fantastic. Anything else? I said, anything about dog races, Ellen? And she just goes, oh, my God, you heard that. <laughs> she goes, it was one of the worst things I ever had to do. Now, take it forward. We take that information, and we wind up having a proffer session with him, with his attorney, Jay Fahey, who, who God rest his soul, he killed him, wound up killing himself. Not over this case, but later on. Um, so we're sitting there, and uh, young young federal prosecutors in the room, myself and my partner, we were a little more experienced, and um, we come in, and the guy's just, you know, Richie, we know you took, you know, this much money from this developer, from from Bernard, you took this much money, whatever. I didn't take it. I didn't take a thing. I didn't take nothing. And we had, we really didn't have enough at that point. So I walk out of the room with the prosecutor, who's now a federal judge, and I'm like, Mike, um, let me just go in and do something crazy. I said, would you go with it? He says, yeah. So I walk in and I just yell, Richie, you took three hundred and fifty fucking thousand dollars from the Mitermans. And he just goes, no, I took one eighty. <laughs> and then he just he realizes like, fuck. You know, so the attorney's like, you can't use that. And we're like, no, <laughs> definitely, that's a, that's a statement. And so that's the same, that's the BJ guy. So, right. hey, how'd you like to be? So it's just, ama you know, amazing, like, how that developed from a, a fake threat, yeah. which we knew wasn't a threat, but we were able to talk to her and get her a little bit more interested in helping us. And she goes out and she gets an immediate bribe, you know, situation. And then she gets the BJ on the dogs. So it was perfect. Right. How'd you like to have that jab? You know, so that's one of, that's one of my better... Like, I just, that whole case just was filled with just a bunch of fucking hilarious New Jersey stuff. You yeah, know? These guys are just not that sharp. No, just I, not. No. I, I was going to say, I, I watched a, a documentary. I think I've mentioned this again uh, one time where they were, the FBI, they were like, listen, you know, they talk in code, but it's not that difficult. We're not dealing with uh, road scholars here. Mm. And they pl the guy plays a recording and the guy, one, one mobster's calling another mobster and he's like, hey, uh, you got the cannolis? <laughs> You have you heard this? I've heard this. Yeah, <laughs> you, got it's the, great. you got the cannolis? He's like, Yeah, I got the cannolis. You got the cannolis. Yeah, I got the cannolis. Okay. You got the bullets for the cannolis? Yeah, I got the bullets for the cannolis. I mean <laughs> and it's like what do you think they're talking about? Yeah, let's <laughs> take a take a wild guess. What are you thinking of? Um I remember I did wrote a book. I wrote a book for a guy named uh, it was called Generation Oxy. And the uh, he said his buddy would call up and he'd call him up and he'd say, Listen, man, I need some uh uh I need some green apples. And he'd go, okay, I don't know what you're talking about. Bro, come on, you know what I'm saying? Bro, I need like four green apples, and I need... He was like, do you have any... Uh, you got any blueberries? And he was, listen, bro, he's like, we're not fucking grocers. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Don't call me with this shit. And he said, he just hung on the phone. He was, he's like, I, he thought they'll never figure that out. <laughs> like, you know, and he's like, you know, uh, whatever. 10 face. milligrams are blue. 50s are green. And he's like, <laughs> he's in there. We got it, buddy. Yeah, nicely, yeah. nicely done. So, so... I did a little bit of law enforcement corruption too along the way. So, no, so we had yeah, not not that there is any, but no. um, if there were, nothing came so, up. No, nothing came up at all. So we we get this we get this complaint in that came through like um, uh, our local county prosecutor's office, and it basically was hey, there's some drugs, you know, some uh, there's a group of police officers in a town that are creating uh, fake search warrant and arrest warrant documents huh? and then going in ripping off drug dealers. It's not ha I'm not so gonna, I'm like, I'm not that's what I said. I said, listen, listen, I have nothing to, you I want nothing to do with that because it never happened. <laughs> and um, so they're like, this is a waste of resources yeah, and time that I don't have. So I said, all right, what do we need to do? So anyway, there's this, there's this urban legend in this town, this same town where uh, there was this crazy diamond bezeled watch that supposedly was lifted from a drug dealer's house and by a cop and that cop then had a relationship where he would get he would give information to the drug dealer and in return the drug dealer would you know pay him and so part of the payment was this watch supposedly so we found out more stuff so anyway 
we're listening to it. We're like, all right, that sounds great. You know, what are we going to do about this? Let's start. Let's open up a case. What's the cop like? What does he do? What squad is he on? He was on like a strike force with a small group of guys in the same town. They always work together. Very similar to the show, the show, The Shield or whatever that was. Right. It, it really reminded me of that situation. So anyway, we, we wind up realizing, okay, this watch that was lifted was by this guy, Life, Jonathan. I forget what Jonathan's real name was, but Life was his street name. So we go over and we see, you know, the, the we see him with his mom. He lived with his mom. So him, hey, anything, you know, did you ever have a, a watch? No, no, never. You know, never had anything uh, lifted, whatever. He says, you know, um, it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's an old rumor, but it never happened. Okay. A couple months later, we get a call from a group of kids um, that were friends with life and they said hey he's lying to you we were in the mall like two weeks ago that watch is still sitting in the front display cabinet of a local jewelry store and here's where the jewelry store is okay so we go into the see the jeweler this guy victor on consignment yep on consignment so we walk in we're like hey how's that watch Uh, you know what's going on with that watch there whose is that he says oh that's um that's phil montgomery's that was the cop's name. Oh, okay. So we're like, oh, okay. So Montgomery, so can we talk to you in the back for a little bit? He's like, yeah, sure. So we go in the back. We're like, hey, bro, you know, that dude stole that watch from a drug dealer. And what's, what's it doing in the front company? He goes, well, I just changed the band on it. I, I didn't know. I didn't really know that that was the case, whatever. Now, what Victor doesn't know is that we had a wiretap up at the time based on these drug ripoffs. Right. So we leave. We said, listen, if you can give us any more information, you know, here's a here's a subpoena so that you're covered. You can come up to grand jury and testify, whatever. We walk out. We literally walk out. The phones are lying. Oh, yeah. Up. Yeah. He's like, hey, Phil, they know the story, you know, whatever. So he says, what did you tell him? And he <laughs> says, I didn't tell him anything. So what do we do? We go right back in. We go, now you're fucking wearing a wire. You yeah. know, here's the recording. So he's shitting his pants. Well, don't you know that one of the guys on our wiretap was working in the same town as this cop? As soon as he knows that Phil's kind of under and that Victor, the calls that Victor was making into his phone to record, yeah. he's given them up. So they plan to kill, they plan to kill Victor. So we're running around a shop right in a small New Jersey town, trying to like run down, make sure that Victor doesn't get killed. We're trying to grab him before Montgomery gets him. And ultimately, we wind up doing it. We wind up arresting Montgomery. In the course of that arrest, now the judge and all his you know, great wisdom releases Montgomery on bond. Montgomery tries to kill himself. So he, he basically goes into his bathtub, cuts his wrist, cuts them wrong. If you want to cut, I, I said yeah, to yeah. him, next time, just tell me, I'll yeah, show you how to do it. Yeah. Just go down this way. Don't go across. I was like, oh, fuck you, you know, whatever. We wind up convicting him. At He goes to trial after giving four. Think about this. He, he gave four proffer sessions. He gave the whole scheme up. And, and then went to trial. And then went to trial? And he got convicted. And he was like, no. I don't know how he got convicted. <laughs> you told us the whole fucking story. And then you went, we just used, we, we got up and testified to your four sessions, your four proffers. And the jury was just like, oh, my God. Yeah, of course. So and, people don't know what a proffer is. Yeah. He, he went in and s- spoke with the FBI, gave a statement on exactly what happened, exactly told them everything. And then at some point after four of these, he then decided, you know what? I'm going to go to trial. Guys. And it was all about because he couldn't stand well, us. Like, I don't like you guys. You guys are out against. And, and you know, the only way you can get in trouble in a proffer is if you lie. Yeah. That's it. As right. long as you, you know, basically just tell us the truth, which he did. He was truthful. And we had that. We had him actually saying, I'm telling this. This is the truth. I, I understand the consequences of not telling the truth in a proffer session. So to then go so, to trial. Yes. It's, it's crazy. Right. So now he gets convicted, but he also brings down the other police officers. Because through his and he decides to testify on on his behalf, and he gets up and he talks about, hey, I was in the service, you know, I did this and I did this. So, so when I basically I come back as a as a rebuttal witness, and the prosecution asks me, Mr., you know, Agent Diario, were you in the service? And I go through my medals and everything that I did, and the jury is just like, you know, we're not even going to buy, we're not even giving veterans preference to this bad guy, yeah, yeah, because we just saw what happened here. Yeah. In the meantime. We wind up convicting like six or seven police officers in this town, destroyed the police department. I mean, caused, actually gave the chief a heart attack. He winds up dying. And then Montgomery, I just found out about a month ago, Montgomery did kill himself. He went to Butner in, in South Carolina for evaluation. How much time did he get? He got, he got like 12 years. Yeah. So as soon as he got out, he killed himself. Um, Why go through the... I know. What do you- I know. So just like cra- the craziness of, of that way of life... You know, I mean, th- this guy was, I mean, there wasn't, there wasn't a drug bust 
or a search warrant that was lucrative or fruitful the entire time this guy was head of the strike force. <laughs> We're, we're, so we're never, everybody we never is paid. To find cash. Nothing. We go in there. There's no drugs. There's no cash. There's no nothing. You um, know. It, so just crazy, crazy stuff. When you think about the sinister mind of people who are carrying a badge and a gun, you know. So I, I have one for you. Okay, this okay. is good. Um, in Atlanta, mm-hmm. there was a task force, a drug task force, like whatever it was eight or 10 guys. I don't know how many they have on six, whatever. Mm. And this was like a notorious task force and they had no knock warrants. Right. Mm. So they're going to go bust a house. Uh, they don't have to knock and say, we're here to serve a search warrant and no time frame on it. So you can go before six, eight, you know, right. Middle of the night. You can go to middle of the night. You probably yep. heard this story. Mm. So, um, they also had what they called like certified confidential informants. So these are guys that he said, we basically, we let them sell drugs in the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Like they can sell drugs. He is in periodically we, t- and that builds their credibility. And then we'll send them in somewhere or they'll give us information periodically. So one day they pull over a car, mm. they find whatever, half a key or something. And they got, grab the guy and they shake him up. Where'd you get this? Where'd you get this? Where'd... And the guy says, look, I, I got it from my dealer. And he gives them an address he goes, So we take that and his money. And we say, well, we say, you tell us, we'll let you go. Mm. He, goes, so he gives us the address. We let him go. He said, we can't use that guy. He said, so we let him go. And then we immediately go. He said, so now we've got the, they got the Coke. They got the money, some little bit of money. They go to one of their certified um, uh, confidential informants. And based on this confidential informants um, affidavit, they get a no-knock warrant. So that's how good these guys are. Cert- They've given us multiple busts. Yep. They're certified. Everything they're saying is true. They just have to give – they write up an affidavit. They say, this is what you're going to say. Mm. You're going to say you've bought drugs from this house several times. This is the dealer. Blah, 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 blah. And they say, okay, great. So he signs off on it. They go to a judge. They get a no-knock warrant. They go to the front door. And he goes, it's got one of those metal. He's it's in a shitty neighborhood, obviously. It's got a, one of the metal door things. He's like, you know, we go up and they, he says, so we boom, we pry it off. And then bam, 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 we kick open the door. He said, we do scream, um, you know, police, whatever. Uh, he said, and as soon as we get the door open, he said, the problem is it took, uh, took like yeah, 30, that 20, bar. 30 seconds mm-hmm. to pry the thing open yep. and kick it open. He said, so he's, uh, I go in first with my gun. He said, as soon as I get in there, he said, there's this long hallway. And he said, there's this woman steps out and boom, boom, boom. He said, shot me right here. So the, the vest shit. is here, goes through the thing Look, of the vest, yeah. right in. He shot me. He said, boom, I fall back and I just open up on her. Boom, 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 boom. She's dead. Um, he said, we go in, we search the whole house. He said, there's no drugs. There's no drugs. He said, the original guy mm. just gave him a, an address mm. next to where his old girlfriend lived. A random, oh, it changed shit. a couple numbers, nothing. Oh, shit. So the guy's name was uh, J- Junior. Everybody called him Junior, the, the, okay. the cop. Now there's, there's like six or eight guys there. And so he, Junior gets shot, but he also kills a woman. Mm. The woman is... Like 75 or an 80 year, like let's say a 75 to an 80, it was an 80 year old retired teacher Mm. who had a little 22 or 38. She woke up in the middle of the night, heard somebody bashing her in that neighborhood. In that neighborhood, walked out. These guys plant drugs in the. Just to cover the murder. Just to cover. Yep. They plant drugs. And, you know, hoping somebody else lives there, hoping it'll... Mm. So they plant drugs, and Junior goes to the hospital, and very quickly, by the way, it's unraveling. I was actually in at the Atlanta uh, Atlanta Union City Jail at the U.S. Marshal's Holdover, and I remember hearing this. It, you know, I was either there or I was at Atlanta City Detention Center, but I remember hearing it on the radio thinking... It doesn't sound right. Like mm. they're talking about shooting an old woman. Like an eighty-year-old woman is not selling drugs. Of course, n- that was when I was still before I'd been sentenced. So yeah. now I actually realize, no, yeah. no, an eighty-year-old woman will sell drugs. Yep. But not a retired school teacher. Right. And the neighbors were coming out. So the radio thing was like she was shot. All the neighbors are coming forward saying that woman's not a drug dealer. Yeah. Like that is a we retired, know drug dealers right. in this neighborhood. That ain't one. That's not one of them. Yep. So immediately, um, internal affairs comes. Right. And he thinks to him, a junior thinks I could, I could 
probably be okay here. He goes, it's starting to come apart. He goes, and this happens, by the way, within days. I'm talking about like within 10 days. Yeah. They're and from the beginning with the certified guy, the certified informant oh, yeah. who they didn't certify right. properly, well, course, obviously. He immediately, he said, he said, as soon as they get him in a room, he yeah. immediately says, man, they told me, they yeah. brought me. Yep. Yeah, periodically they do, they, they always tell me, if you don't sign this, you're going to fucking prison. You're going this, we're going to prosecute for everything we got. He's like, I, I'm, you understand? He's like, I'm a slave. Mm. Like, yeah, I'll do whatever these guys have mm. to say. So he buckles immediately. And then what happens is internal affairs, um, ends up basically the feds come in okay and they because now we're talking this happened so quickly i remember t- yeah, talking, no time at all right so dea is brought in or bureau no no bureau okay FBI comes okay in. so the fbi comes in and so he gets out he gets out like they two days out he's in the hospital like overnight practically okay. maybe two days he gets out goes home and says he said i've been he said I, i've been around a while he goes i know he said, look, I, I, I loved the guys on my squad. He said, but we all know what just happened. He said, and they're all going to flip. He said, they're going to flip on me because they know if we go to trial and anybody else flips, they're all going to end up with, going to prison for 20 years. Yep. He was so I realized I'm the one that shot her. I'm like the team leader. I'm the team this. I'm the one with the, in the most jeopardy. Mm. I killed this woman. He goes, he said, I, I'm the one that, he never said I killed. He always said I shot. Mm. You know, I'm the one that shot her. He goes, so I know where it's a problem. He said, so I immediately grab my lawyer. I go to the FBI. He works out a deal with the prosecutors. I will cooperate against all these other guys, tell you all the stuff we did. I get to retire. He gets keeps all of his money. What the fuck? He gives up everybody. Everybody else got about ten years and lost their job, lost oh, their lost pension, everything. lost everything. He um, and he he kept his pension. This motherfucker. Um, I'm pretty sure. I mean, he didn't get to retire because he hadn't been there long enough. Right. But he keeps the pension when he does retire. Um, l- listen, his wife used to come in a three hundred thousand dollar RV. Oh my god. She used god. to drive down and park it in the oh parking lot and come see him in jail. So here's what he was, and he was upset about this. I think Colby might have heard this story before. He was upset about this. When I'm talking to him, he was like, he was pissed off because he's like, he was sentenced in the state for the murder, right? For, it wasn't murder though. They got him for like, homo, like a, a, what do you call it? Like a manslaughter. manslaughter. Yeah. So he was upset because he, he was, he got like five years or, but five years plus good time plus this, but he's like, I would have been out in like three years, two, mm. two, three years in the state. They run them at the same time, never goes to state. Has to do his time in the feds, which in a low, which is where he wanted to be. So, and he said when he got to sentencing, he said he had worked out a deal where they were going to recommend like 36 months. Uh, So that he said that way, by the time the state thing is ready to put me out on parole, I'm out of the feds. He said, and he was telling me the story. I was like, right, right. He goes, he goes, that fucking federal judge gave me like 63 months. He was pissed about it and he's like i can't he's like everything i did for these motherfuckers and he's like he's like i mean fucking piece of shit and he sat there and i went Dude, you, i go you did murder someone you killed a, he, a school teacher 80 year old school right. teacher and he in, looked at in and he, the middle middle of the fucking night but here's what he said to me when i said i go you did kill a woman he looked at me and he, and he goes bro she shot me first and i went you broke in her house exactly. in the middle of the night. He said, we said police. And I was just like, like he, and I was like, like, like Yeah, like nobody else would say, would say police if they're or, breaking yeah, in the house in that neighborhood. Everybody, the just, right. street code That's says you don't. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, I mean, talk about fucking delusional. And listen, something was wrong with this guy, by the way. When he got, when initially the photos of him, this is what you tell me. Initially, the photos that we've seen of, of him uh, in the newspaper, he was about probably... He was probably, let's say, he was about 5'9", about mm-hmm. and he was probably 210, 220. He was about a buck 40 in prison. No. His teeth were starting to rot. He would, here's the thing, and I didn't even know this because I was in the, it took about six months to a year before somebody said, oh, he's fucked up. And I was like, why is he fucked up? He would go eat, come back to the unit, and go in the bathroom and throw up. And, and I was like, what? And they were like, oh, watch. We would sit there and we would be making food. Like they had a bag lunches one yeah. time because the kitchen were closed. They give us bag lunches. They go, watch Junior. As soon as he eats, he's going to the bathroom. We sat there. He's eating a sandwich. As soon as he was done, he was like, he walks in the bathroom. And I walk in behind him and I hear him in, 
very just, quiet throwing yeah, up. Yeah. But in there, and now I'm paying attention. And I start realizing yeah. he's puking. Every time he eats, he pukes. And he used to say, and I go, bro, you've lost a lot of well, weight. Yeah. And he was like, well, you know, this prison, the prison food, they don't feed us good here. It's like, wait a minute, it's a bologna sandwich, bro. Yeah. You're fine. Yeah. It's not making you throw up. Yeah. I, I always felt like maybe, and this seems maybe very simplistic, but, you know, like maybe his conscience yeah, or something. He's punishing himself for doing that, for killing that yeah, woman. Yeah, it doesn't realize, because yeah. in person, he'd say fucked up shit. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But it's like deep down, like you gotta. Yeah, you, gotta, you, killed, like, you killed her in the middle of the night knowing that you did that. You, Fuck, I, yeah. I mean, I at least hope no due diligence. Like, I, I, it, I think he'd probably stop throwing up. Maybe he'd be okay if he just admit to it. What I yeah, did was fucked up, it. and I'm, but yep. he did. He wouldn't. He couldn't do it. Yeah, he yeah. couldn't admit that. That's crazy. And though. it's funny too because you could see his teeth, like especially in the back, you could see his teeth where they were kind of like, like that acid. You can't do that every day. No, definitely not. I mean, um, you're forcing yourself so, to do that. It screws up your body, bro, your he organs. Was, he was like a skeleton. Oh he was so man, skinny. I wonder. So, so he just. Basically, I, I feel for that woman. Think about that. She's a retired teacher. She's got to live in the terrified. house like that. She's got to live with a steel plate and everything else that comes with that to make sure she doesn't get bashed in, you yeah. know, every she, night. She must have been terrified. She probably she had a little fucked. bit of pension money so that anybody was fucking looking to scam her, take it. You know what I mean? Like go in there and rob her, you know? Yeah, that's. So she had to put that. To, oh, my God. And then this dude kills her. And then they were trying to say she was a drug dealer. Well, like that, that, they saying, tried that thank for, God for the days. Neighborhood, neighborhoods like, no, yeah. that no, ain't happening. No, There's not. a lot of people that are like that, we're but not that doing she that. ain't one of them. Yeah. That's terrible shit. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so much of that stuff. We had we had another case that is, I'm thinking about it now. We had a case in uh, Seaside Heights after Sandy, Superstorm Sandy right. in 2012, right? So um, we get this portion of New Jersey, the, the famous picture with the roller coaster in the ocean Yeah, from Sandy. That's Seaside Heights. Right. And there had always been talk about uh, the chief there being a little bit like, you know, a little too friendly with the business developers and making a ton of money and some businesses on the side. I, you know, I, don't have no, I have nothing against the guy, but he's definitely a little questionable at best. Right. Um, so we get Sandy hits. Um, we get a call from the 7-Eleven. There was a there was a couple that owned two 7-Eleven franchises in Seaside Heights. And they call us and they're like, hey, you know, we've got damage, but we're really, it's weird what's happened to our store. So I'm like, what do you mean it's weird? Like, yeah, we're missing like all the cash and all the scratch off lottery tickets. And she said, these were all locked up and and not wet. They didn't get damaged. All that shit's gone in both our stores. So like, holy cow, that's totally unusual, you know? So we start looking into it a little bit. We try to get video. There's no video that's available there at the store. Um, We talk to the police department. You know, we're like, hey, did you guys hear anything about people, you know, um, bashing in windows and taking shit and doing what they weren't? No. You know, did you guys go in seven? Yeah, well, we did because there's and there is there is like emergency um, management law, some type of law, some type of policy in these barrier towns where if something were to happen like that, they can go ahead and take some of that equipment that they need, flashlights, yeah, uh, you know, uh, uh, shovels, whatever, to take it and then just invoice it and pay that back. So they show us the thing. Yeah, you know, we did take some of that stuff. So now we're like, all right, wait a minute. Who else was in those stores? Well, nobody really. Oh, you know, we went in. We right. we took some food. We needed food. It was going to go bad anyway. Some of it was damaged. Took some some drinks. And okay. Um, and then we get another an Army Navy store, a local Army Navy store. The guys like, yeah, they they took like a shitload of my stuff. We said, well, you know, shoes and that stuff. They can take that stuff and then they'll pay you back. They didn't give us any invoice. Now it starts to like. So I'm questioning the chief a little bit. Like, hey, anything about that? No. So they're looting. No idea. They're looting. The cops are looting. Cops are looting. So now I'm like, oh my god. I said nothing about like scratch offs or or cash or anything. No, no. We took. I can tell you what we took. I made a. You know, now all of a sudden an an invoice, like an inventory, appears. Right. So I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute. So I've got connections at Seven Eleven. So I I call basically the asset protection guy at Seven Eleven and say, do you guys by chance like keep copies of these tapes? Do you have like a central? He said we do. It's regionalized, but we definitely have. If power goes out in some spot, we should have some video. So I get the video. My boys, there's my boys taking cash and taking scratch offs. Right. So we can't as as the federal government cannot charge an we don't have an official misconduct charge. Okay. We just don't have it. So we pass it along to the local prosecutor's office, who then charges official misconduct on these cops. And the big the the worst kick in the kick in the face to these people is slap in the face was they kept 
the winners and took them across state and had people cash them in for them. Right. And like straw straw people, straw yeah, yeah. donors to go in and they gave them a little bit of money for that and they left the losers all over the floor. Okay. So to me, like thinking about the craziness that happens, a storm hits your community, your local law enforcement. You're supposed to be out there doing the right thing. You're supposed to be saving lives and helping people. And you take scratch off lottery tickets. Lottery tickets. That was enough to fucking destroy your pension and destroy your time. And the chief never, I never could get him. I never could get, we didn't have anything on him. He wasn't there. And I could never get anybody to flip and say, oh, he's the one who said, go, you know, give me some of those. And their cigarettes were missed. Like other things that I thought maybe he had. Um, In the meantime, like this guy, this guy is so fucking corrupt that the people, so Seaside Heights is a community that has this beautiful boardwalk. It's not so beautiful anymore, but it's got a bunch of different rides. It's got like a water park. It's got golf, mini golf courses. Really used to be spectacular. The gunite, the spray for the pool slides in this place, the company that does that put a pool in the chief's, in the chief's yard that's, and in the chief's girlfriend's yard. That's common. That's a, that's a coincidence. It, it's a it coincidence. It, it always happens. Yeah. So I would walk into this police headquarters and just, and he was, he was banging the secretary, the, the records girl. And she, I said, Hey, how's your pool one time? And he came charging like out from down. So he's watching me on camera, like, fuck you, you motherfucker. You know, <laughs> let's go. I'm going to bet. I'm like, how's your pool? I said, matter of fact, I was just over your house. I took some pictures. Your wife is, your wife is out there. I want to tell her that it's um, unbelievable. But so-and-so's pool is the exact same as yours. But, but like the, the corrupt nature of, yeah. hey, I, and this guy's the, he's the highest paid chief still in New Jersey. He makes over three, it's a seasonal town. He makes over 300K a year as a police chief. It's a lot. And he's right? still, and he's taking freebies. But anyway, if you're out there, you know who you are. I'm still looking at you, motherfucker. <laughs> oh, man. That's terrible. I should have said that. I, um, mean, I don't mean that. I don't mean that. Uh, that much. Collarbone. Collarbone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, people. You know, pe- people, what, what, man. What happens is you get away with something. You become emboldened by it. Yeah. Especially if you're in a position of authority. Yeah. You start to think you're just, you're above the law. Yeah. And what, yeah, what is it, what is the common denominator for people put in power that immediately try to abuse it? I think. Why does that happen? I don't know what those, what makes up those people, but I I think that, you know, there's, there's a lot of people that just, they, they get in the position and they're fine. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But then there's a lot of people that just, they think, Hey, I've, I've arrived, I've made it. And now I'm just going to take advantage of this situation. And it's like, Oh wow. Like to lower level, like the levels of, of craziness. Yeah. You know, like it, it goes from, I look at all levels of, it. I look at that, what we just talked about, plus the cop in Atlanta. Yeah. And then you look at like, even what bothers me, and I know it shouldn't bother me in any way, but if I go into a Dunkin' Donuts or I go into a, a coffee place and there's uniform officers and they're not, they're not paying for their way. Like we, we at, at Jersey Mike's, you know, we have a discount. Like if a cop comes in in uniform, it's half price. Right. I don't care what, I'm going to do that and franchise, you know, the corporation, whatever, but to take it for, or to expect something for free, that, that's where it starts to me. Yeah. And I can remember as as a young agent, I walked into our hometown, Dunkin' Donuts, and there was a New Jersey State Trooper, and he had ordered probably 40 or $50 worth of stuff and just walked out. Like, he's like, yeah. So I said something to him. Dude, you, you know, you're going to pay for it. He just told me to mind my fucking business. So I was like, no, you know, if you're in uniform and you're coming in for a cup of coffee and that owner wants to do that for you, that's a different story. But you don't you don't take, like, the whole squads yeah yeah he's got two dozen donuts and this this guy's trying to this guy's used to from where this guy's from his portion of the world police are corrupt yeah so he has to do that or he's gonna get his ass beat we don't do that here so he started like really jumping my shit and i said hey who when you went through the state police academy who was your instructor in ethics and and morals and he said oh uh and he mentioned my (laughs) ex-brother-in-law i'm like he's gonna love he's gonna love to hear this story and he's like, oh, please. and then his tune changed. Let me pay. I'm like, I think it's too late. I said, I already paid, just so you know, for you. And I don't have a lot of money either because I'm right. a, a brand new FBI agent. But you really 
don't do that. Like, right. don't put that kind of spot. But it start. I think it starts there, and then you're right. I think when they, I've arrived. I can do more. I can, you know, be this. I can get this for free. I can. Not everybody's like that, and I know that most guys are not like that. Yeah, not like that. But the ones that are, I think, are the ones that develop into a different mindset to do stupid stuff. I haven't been caught. I've got a badge and a gun. I can cover my ass. Boom. Well, you ever you ever, you ever watch the like, get the the TikToks and shorts and stuff where they show the officers, you know, get, uh, let me see your ID. I'm I'm just sitting here. Like what, yeah. for what? Yeah. Uh, suspicious uh, activity. Yeah. Suspic- I'm sitting on the side of the road eating yeah. my sandwich. It's my break. Like. Yep. And then they, are you are you going to go down that way? Okay, I'm calling back up. Okay, you know, know. what? And it's like and escalate it. Doing anything? Just like, talk to right. Talk to a person. Right. And and it just of course I always hate the. The auditors that what do they call them? Um, First Amendment auditors. The First Amendment auditors that it's like there's some of them that I like. Some of them I like, but some of them like like, stop. You're calling this guy names. You're being an asshole. Like I know. Even now, I want you to give him your papers. Yep. Exactly. You know. Matter of fact, we we I interviewed a guy. Um, and he tells this whole story. He ends up getting himself arrested. Goes to trial. Loses at trial. Like Mm. he and it genuinely like they just don't listen to anything he's saying and, right and it's like and at the end he says uh what he said he said to me um what did he say he said do you see he said you think i did the right thing right and i went no no <laughs> <laughs> he's like absolutely no what and i yeah. said no no i said listen i said first of all i've been through the system yep. you know I, I i think i said something else first and then i came to and you know what it really boils down to is i said i've been through the system you're not gonna win I, I'm just going to give you my ID. I don't, I don't feel like I have to. Uh, I'm going to because I want to move on. I don't want to die on. This is not the hill I want to die on. Exactly. I, I'm going to give you my ID. Take a look at my ID. Let me go. I said, that, that, that's where it is. Because I've seen the system go so badly. Yep. And even you can sit there the whole time and say that I didn't do anything. I've got the law on my side. I've got this. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter. really matter. It doesn't matter. Area. Right. So It doesn't matter. You're going to fight that fight another day, and it's not going to work for you. And when, you know what's, what's, what's really upset me about that? Was that and the big thing was it was he was just going into public records. So mm-hmm. you're going into the courthouse and they want to see his ID. And he's yeah. like, no, I don't have to. And yeah. so then the guy's like, no, you're going to show. He's like, no, I'm not. And he walks straight in to get his mother's death certificate. Now, here's the thing. I said, when you get your mother's death certificate, you knew you had to show them your ID. Yeah. Well, yeah, he goes, I'll show mine, them, but not this guy. And I went. Like, bro, like three minutes later, you yeah, were to show you're your ID. Yeah, you're ID. Just show your ID. You're not proving no. anything. And I said, you, you know, look you, like an ass. Well, you know, I said, I said, you know what you could have done? You could have showed them your ID. So I don't have to, but here, no problem. Okay, fine. They take it down. You go get your thing. I said, and then you could have written up a, a complaint. I was and trying to get, it. yeah, this a sad on, time in my life. Right. I, well, and yeah, yeah, by the way, you're not supposed to be doing yeah, this. Yeah, don't do that. Go, you to, know? go to city council. Go yes. in and say, look, here's what they're doing. That's not right. Like, do it the right way. Right. Do but, it the right way, no. you know? And, and and I just think across the board, yeah, it, it, you're never going to win. You're never winning that battle. Right. You're not going to do it, you know? And and I, I like, I don't know, I never, it, it's weird, but there's a lot of uh, liaison work that goes with the bureau, especially when you're tight with the community of local law enforcement. And right. I never felt comfortable going to like the chief's meetings or going to the, because I never wanted to put them or me on the spot if we ever had to investigate their department. Right. And and that was viewed the wrong way. That was viewed like, oh, that dude thinks he's better or that thing, you know, oh, just because he's this. That. No, it was always because I didn't want ever have a situation where I'm questioning you about one of your cops or you yourself or something else, or you're questioning me about one of my agents. And, and we, we now are, have a relationship. So it's personal. Right. I never wanted to do that, you know? And it's like, it, it, it really backfired for a long time. Now I've gotten tons of phone calls and stuff. Hey dude, we kind of know we're in that situation now. We kind of understand, right. You know, we kind of understand what you're going through and why you went through it. Well, um, I was going to say, you know, the thing is, I think that they they just sometimes, they just say whatever they're going to say because people, as a law enforcement officer, the public just accepts it. Yes. You know what I'm saying? It never comes back on them. They just say whatever they want and never comes back. Mm -hmm. But I was going to say, it's funny, I interviewed the chief of police on, uh, for Okeechobee uh, County. And, you know, so very quickly in the interview, you know, he realizes I was incarcerated. You know, so immediately his attitude changed. The, the guy that used to be the head of the 
drug task force changed. Like everybody's attitude changed. And he, he, he got this look on his face that was like disgusted. And I was like, okay, well, I'm, I'm working on a, on a story. I'm a, rep- I'm a reporter working on a story, an article, you know. And I'm like, and, and, I, and I, so, and I, you know, he, somebody says something and I could have dodged it. Yeah. But they're like, well, so how'd you end up meeting the subject, right? Like, how'd you yeah. end up meeting? And I went, um, oh, I said, I, I met her in, uh, in the halfway house. And he's like, what were you doing in the halfway house? And I was like, and so I, I was like, okay, now I have, yeah. to, I have to address yeah. it. So I said, well, I was there for this, boom, boom, boom. I went to, you know, for fraud and this and that. And I said, but I met her. She had a great story. So I ended up pitching the story and now I'm writing a story, an article on her. So I interview him. And as I'm interviewing me, so he's now they neither one really want to talk to me. Yeah. They're real short. But what's so funny is he's. I'm asking him questions. He's like, "Yeah, it's uh, it's this. I don't remember. Uh, I, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, you know." And and he's at, and he says, uh, he says, "Yeah." Um, he's like, "Listen, we don't have all those records. It's a long. It's an old case. It's not an old case. But he's like, it's an old case. He says, and we don't have those records here, and we don't have an opportunity to look over those records. He says, and we don't keep records like that here at the station. He said, he said, he said they're archived, or they. I don't even know if they exist anymore. So he said, we don't have those, so I can't give you those specifics. And I go, he said, so I don't know. I don't know about that. I said, no, no. I said, I, I know who the informants are. Here's who they are. I said, I've already ordered the Freedom of Public Records, and I go, I said, I've already got the records because the records department, by the way, was once one was a. Yeah, two rooms right over there. and yeah. I got it from your department Yeah, and you do have the records yeah. and like everything he said. So as I, I said, I've already got the records from the, I said from the freedom of information act, I said, Mr. So-and-so has already given me the record. So I already know who they are. It's this person, this person. I'm just wondering if, and I, and you could see the look on his face was that he just got caught in a blatant lie. Oh, hell yeah. And at that point he's like, why don't you go ahead and wrap up these questions so we can get going and get this done. So somebody can, so you can do your little article. And I thought, a little, art, fuck you. little article. Yeah. Like, condescending prick. Yeah, immediately. And I thought, yeah. I guess that it, it you talk to people like that and it never catches up to you and you become, I don't know, you just, you know, it was, was, here's what's so funny about that. I mentioned that because the article I was writing was basically about this little town that has this, um, this, 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 huge issue with methamphetamine mm-hmm. it's overrun the town it's become this massive problem that's coming in through through the everglades it's coming in through uh, these different channels it's being brought in from mexico it's being shipped down here and you've got this little tiny um sheriff's department with a small budget and not enough officers to handle this problem and they are doing the best that they can and when I wa- and that was the, that was how I wanted to portray them. Like yes. they're doing the yes. best they they're can. They're fighting the good fight. My subject even said, who mentions, talks about the one guy who used to be in charge of the task force. She's like, everybody hates his guts. He's a complete asshole. She said, but here's the thing. She goes, he was raised in this town. Mm. He's got a wife and, and like two or three kids in this town. His neighbors are all on meth. He's watching meth destroy his town. She goes. So he has every right to be an asshole. Yeah. This is my subject. Yeah. So while I'm saying like, so when I went in there, I was like gonna, I really wanted to put them in the best light. Yeah. Like they're, they're give, fighting give a, them the a, benefit a horrible of the doubt. battle. Yeah. And when I walked out, it became, fuck you. You're a fucking, yeah. you're yeah. just a scumbag piece of yep. garbage. Like, yep. like, you know, you're this backwards hillbilly backwoods sheriff now. <laughs> like, and all you True. had to do was be just, be polite. Yeah. And be professional. Not lie to me. Yeah. Just be professional. You so, know. So I don't know. You know. I yeah. don't. Like I said, I don't know what happens to these guys. I know it's a level. I, I think it's. You know, the other the other issue too is the quick with the hands. Yeah. You know that was that was like. That was always like a, a respected thing. With with cops, like not right. You know. And you could see it, like, oh, he's really good. You know, he's a tough guy. He's good in the boxing, whatever. But how do we not? How did we go from that being able to maybe assist to proactively looking for those things? Like, I want to fight. I want right. to beat some people up. I want to tune some people up. And, and then you have the George Floyd type issues. You right. know, like I was asked a couple times, like, what would you have done? I go, it's a simple thing. I don't care what his background is. I don't care how much crack or whatever he was on right bottom line is it's simple and those and now you're finding out those two dudes knew each other too floyd and the cop oh really yeah they'd, they'd have from run-ins. years past oh, okay like from high school or something oh, okay. crazy not even so, run-ins i mean it's like hey mr floyd, they, and and they had that happen a million times mr floyd get in the back of the car right we'll talk to you in a little bit done 
Right. Well, and lives aren't ruined. All, he's in handcuffs all right already. He's in handcuffs. He's not going to do anything. Right. And and if he does, you know, okay, you just put him put him in the car. What is he still doing on the road? Pick him up and put him in the car. You got him in handcuffs. Um, you know what I mean? Like just just the the people. And there's a lot. There's a lot of that too. I, I manage. I, I I worked the civil rights unit and. In, in uh, FBI headquarters. Okay. I did that for a short time. Um, that human trafficking. You can't believe how much of that shit comes in every fucking day. Yeah. Like hundreds of complaints. Hundreds of complaints. You know, and, and some of the time it's like, man, the cops are doing the right thing. I mean, right. they truly do. Yeah, some of the time some it's, of the time it's they're bullshit, not. right? You know, some but, of the time they're not. But you listen, with the, body, evident. with the body cams and everything, yeah. like, I, I watched a TikTok a week ago where literally the chick's 115 pounds, mm-hmm. the cop's 220 pounds. He's got her on the hood of the car, or she's just leaning over. He's hand, he's putting, he's, she's, she's being not belligerent. She's like, I don't understand. What is the problem? Yeah. But he's got the handcuffs Certain. on her. Yeah. <laughs> They're yeah. done. Handcuffs are on That's her. It. And she she's like, what is your problem? He boom, boom, and slams her on the ground. It's like, she's in handcuffs. Yep. She just turned around. Yep. She's not a danger. You're a, you got 100 pounds on her. Yep. Did you just throw a 115-pound girl on the fucking pavement? Who can't put her hands out? Yeah, she just smashed her face. Like, it's like, boom. And it talks of about course. how it was a lawsuit and blah, blah, of blah. Course. But it was like, yeah. It, you know, the camera's right. Like, you felt so confident in your ability to harm this person, and you wanted to. Mm-hmm. When you watch those tapes, you realize, like, every time I see one of these types of tapes, even when the guys are belligerent the, and the cops are just overly just aggressive, I, I always think, man, this guy should not be a cop. It shouldn't be a cop, and that's what I mean. Like, the quick hands, it's all about it's all about talking, you know, mental, like, mental Aikido, you know, mental yeah, judo, yeah. you know, doing that. Like, hey— how do you talk? How do you talk this person out of the belligerence? First off, right. and how do you approach it so that you don't appear that way? Yeah, you know that I, I, we've lost that. We've lost that. You know, and um, right with the body cams, you think they would? They don't even think they don't even have enough sense to think about that. Not that it's right, but don't you understand? Like the world is watching. Yeah, you know. So if you are crazy and you think you want to do that stuff. Well, you're you're definitely going to be answering questions. Yeah, you know, in in the past it wasn't like that. You know, I mean, before body cams, it wasn't that long ago. No, so you're I my mean, word against your. That's I'm a police officer. That's it. I'm going to win. Yeah. yeah, I'm going to win every single time. Um, I, I don't know. Well, it, it just I don't know what the answer is. You know, but I do think it's I do think it starts in training. I do think it starts with these police academies and state police academies and Quantico to be able to teach people how to talk, how to, how to be more human. Right. You know, how to use those skills. I think that's much more, to me, uh, it's much more civil. You know, it's much more, it's much more um, non-divisive. Right. <laughs> Which just continue to, to divide the country in every way, that being one of them. I you know, always, law enforcement <laughs> against those who aren't. I always love there's this TikToker. He's constantly saying to the cop, he's like, de-escalate, de-escalate. de-escalate. I de-escalate. think I've seen that guy, yeah. De-escalate. <laughs> it's I like, like you. every yeah. time. Like, yeah. you're clearly bringing a oh, something on God. yourself because I, every time I, you have an interaction. How about the it. dude who's like the bounty hunter, but he also does uh, uh, repos and different things. He's like a, he's a, he's a, he's a jack. No, he's not really jacked. He's like a thinner black dude. But he's tough as shit. His wife's um, Hispanic, and they just go around like, oh, hey, yeah, got- yeah, no, he's oh, a repo my- guy. Yeah, oh, yeah. dude, it's the best. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. He's like, I'm going to throw some smoke on you yeah. now. <laughs> and, and, like, these guys are big, and he yeah. winds up tuning them. I want to see the real video because yeah, all, all sure you see got, is, like, yeah. the black. Oh, God. It just cracks me up. Um, I don't know. It's just crazy, man. Crazy what's going on. It's just I, I don't understand. You know, I, I do think, though, training – Training and, and just humanity is is the answer as we get closer. I mean, it's going to blow up. You know, it's going to blow up. Yeah. We're, we're almost at the stage where law enforcement is like they are in other countries. You know, yeah. Just a little bit more corrupt and in it for the wrong reason. You know? you know, what's so funny is like when I got locked up, guys were like, you know, oh, the, the cops are the biggest gang out there. And the cops. Are, and I used to always think, you know, OK, whatever. But the more cases you hear, the more you read, the more you see, it's like. Mm. Jesus, like, you know, so it's, it's, and here, here's what really, what makes it even worse is like, if there's a bad cop here, mm. what really upsets me is, okay, that's a bad cop. We can get rid of him. The fact that all these other cops won't say anything. Yep. Like, oh, bro. Like, that's you know, the truth, man. that's the, this is the problem. Yep. You know, he's fucked up. Hey, I even, 
interviewed a cop that said, um, yeah, I had, there was this one cop and they, they like sent me to the house and he was there. And I was like, yeah, yeah listen, man. He's like, he's told dispatch. He's like, I really don't want to go on this call. And they were like, why? Well, so-and-so's there. He's like, he's, he was, he was overly aggressive. He was like, he was constantly getting, uh, there's constantly a problem with this guy because he's constantly ugh. pushing the boundaries and he's constantly telling people, well, no, I can come in. He's like, and they're like, you don't have a warrant. You can't come in. Will you? Yeah, I can. And he's like, he's like, I'm like having to step in front of him going, Hey, 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 hey look, look, what's, what's your problem? He's like, what's my, like, yeah. you don't have a warrant. You're not going in. Like exactly that kind of stuff. And, yeah. and you know, but he's like, but then the problem is, is it, it escalates. He's like, and yeah, and you know, you don't want to say anything. You don't know. Right, so it's a whole Serpico thing. You're, you're that one, you're that one guy. And next thing you know, it goes bad. It does go bad too. You see you know stories Serpico, nowadays. Let's just watch yeah. this. You know what Serpico is? Unbelievable. <laughs> I'm going to write, Serpico. I'm going to write, I'm going to send you home with two assignments. Serpico. Unbelievable. But yeah, yeah, he doesn't know Serpico. Frank Serpico, man. Great story. But yeah, I mean, I think you're right. I mean, I think there's just even even the George Floyd thing. Like, why didn't one of those other guys say, "Bro, get off his neck"? Yeah, what, like, are, you what are you fucking doing? Yeah, you know, you, you don't need to do that. No, like, I, I, I it's, put him in the car and call it a day. There's no or let him go. I mean, right. if he took off, don't. I mean, we always used to talk about it. there's another day. Well, first of all, there's he's got cuffs day. on. He ain't, he ain't going, going far. Anywhere. You ever try and run with your hands behind your exactly. back? Exactly. Not- Good luck. You know. I oh mean, my God. It's a safe. Well, it's a safety right. issue. It's not really. You killed him. Junior told me a story one time. They were chasing a drug dealer. Yeah. And then we'll wrap it up because this yeah. is. So, but Junior, they were tra- chasing a drug dealer one time. Yeah. He said, and it's going over the overpass. Okay. He said, so we're oh. running t- towards an overpass. Oh and shit. He said, so he's running towards the overpass. He said, well. Um, he said, you know how on the overpass there's the overpass. He said, but on the side of it, like it goes down. Yes. He goes, well, one of his buddies jumps. Over lands and starts running off. He goes, so you can see him running kind of down the the embankment. He goes, well, this guy runs. Oh. He said, he runs maybe thirty more feet. He was but thirty feet on that incline. Oh hell yeah! And then he jumps, and he said he jumps. Obviously, there's no ground now. Oh. He goes, he spins around. He hits the uh, the fence, oh. and it hits him. He said directly in the back of the neck. Pierces the neck, rips his head straight off. Holy head is sitting there. He said, the head is sitting on oh he, So when we, God. he goes, I woe to jump over. And he said, he, when he, it was him or one of his guys, go to jump over. And they grab onto the thing. Like they, they realize what's yeah. happened. And Holy they're like, crap. oh, he's like, yeah. he's like, we pull him up. He goes, then we go back, we run down. He said, uh, we're sitting there. And he said, by the way, it's like his body had slid down even further. He goes, yeah. so the body's like 10 feet over yeah. here. He said, his head's on the fucking, oh. on, on the pole. He said, Fucking, he said, most insane thing he had oh ever seen in his gosh. life. He said it was that horrific. Is horrific is right. And he said, like the the, the time. He said, the, oh, you think couldn't about have that. planned it. Oh, you couldn't have. About, yeah, think about the PTS that comes with seeing that. I was gonna. I, I got to talk about this a little bit. And so I had a transformation uh, from my faith about a year and a half ago. Okay, it's an interesting. It's it's a crazy story, and things happen to this day. the The guy who just drove me from my hotel here to your house, it's, right. it's a it's a godsend for me. It's amazing how things happen. So I'll tell you a little bit about the story. Um, you know, Catholic family, um, sit down, stand up, fight, fight, fight in the parking lot. That's the Catholic faith in a nutshell. Uh, again, not discounting what people believe. I think there's wonderful pieces of that religion that go forward. There's some things that are not so great. Um, I had a diocese that I was hired by, big time diocese in the Northeast, to what I believed was to uh, assist victims of sexual assaults by by the brethren and and the clergy. And uh, what I found out is it wasn't. It was to negotiate with those victims um, in order to make sure that we got the best deal for the church. Right. So we'll leave it at that, what I thought. So I was looking for another thing. Um, I wanted to to experience something else. I started to read the Bible a little bit. I started to think about, you know, what what the deal, but realized I I just don't have time for that. This is about a year and a half ago. One of my best buddies from West Point, his wife had suffered with cancer for six years, like terrible cancer. And and she finally um, went went home to God uh, last October, October of 2022. Um, so a year, holy cow, a year, a year plus ago. And, um, he called me, he said, Hey, I'm putting Lori in hospice and I uh, just want you to know, you know, we're real good buddies. And I said, okay, no problem. My wife at the time said, Hey, you know, you have to go to that wake, right? It's in Lincoln, Nebraska. We're living in New Jersey. I'm like, ah, I don't, I don't really have time to go to that. You know, what am I going to offer to go to that? Uh, I really don't want to go. 
So uh, anyway, one of my other buddies calls me and says, hey, you have the details on, on Lori's wake? I said, I do. He said, are you going? I said, no. He said, well, I'm going to go. You know, I'm driving from Chicago to Lincoln, Nebraska uh, on Friday. So I tell you what, get your ass out here by Thursday. Right. And I was like, no, I'm not going to do it, not going to do it. Next thing you know, Why? I'm in the car. I don't know. I just it, always things like that are always like, what, what if something, you know, what if I have to believe something different? You know, if I go out there and, and I just want to stay in my own little world, you know, I'm happy. I'm happy doing a, a, a decade of, of the rosary, you know, once in a blue moon during Lent and, and right. maybe 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 not eating that Western Whopper on Fridays. during right. Lent. Maybe not eating it. But sometimes I did. Um, so I, I find myself in a car, man, heading out there, you know, and I'm like, what the hell am I doing? Right. Driving out to, to Chicago, like eight hours to Chicago. Get there. We play golf one day. Uh, next morning, he says, I'll drive. We're going to drive to Lincoln. So I jump in the car. We start driving. And he doesn't start in right away, but he's like, hey, let me ask you something. You struggling with faith? You know? And he's a believer. He, he's, right. a, he's a big-time believer. And not, I didn't think he was as much as he, he is, but he lives his life that way. So I right. should have known. And so we start going out. And he starts he telling push me. push it on it. On not you. at you all. You always think they're going to push it on you. Never. He doesn't say anything, yeah. but except for this ride, he's just, what's going on, you know? So I explained to him, like, this is going wrong. My marriage is falling apart. I don't feel good. You know, I'm worried about this. I'm worried about money. I'm worried about, you know, where I'm going to live. All this. And he, he listens the whole way. He's like, well, you know, there's only one answer. And he kept saying that. Finally, right. I'm like, dude, would you shut the fuck up? Like, honestly, right. I'm sick and fucking tired of hearing about it. All right. I don't want to hear it anymore. You know, so he's like, well, you're willing to roll the dice on that, bro? You know, and I'm like, yeah, I'm willing because there's nothing. You know, if there was anything, things like this wouldn't happen in the world. Bad things wouldn't happen. All those excuses yeah, yeah, that yeah. I thought about. And we're heading to this this best buddy of ours who lost his wife a couple of days before. But it's all about me. Now, yeah. You know, so finally we finished with the eight hour ride. We're checking into the hotel. I'm even saying I'm going to get my own room, man. I don't want to stay with you. No, I'll, I'll Uber <laughs> over to the thing. I just said, had it, right. So he says to me, like, hey, all those things that are going on, you know, you, you seem to have a pretty good grip on that stuff. And he said, so no, no belief in that there's, a, there's, there's God's looking out for you and still here and faithful to you? I said, no. He says, well, it sounds like your way. It's working out just great for you. Yeah, I was going to say. Well, I was what, like, what? fuck you. You know, li like literally. And here we are. I get dressed for the wake. We get in the car. We're not talking. We pull in front of this, you know, church, this Bible church in Lincoln, Nebraska, where my buddy, you know, has been a worshiper and believer there for years with his wife who just passed. We walk in, there's probably like a hundred people in the vestibule waiting to go in to see and pay their respects. And the woman says, Hey, can you just sign in here who you are? Door pops open, right? There's no way that this dude could see anything. You know, there's no way that he could say, and I'm thinking, why am I here? What the fuck? This is unbelievable. I'm pissed off at the world. He comes right over to me. He doesn't look at anybody else. He puts his arms around me. He says, I knew you'd be here. Mm. And I was like, man, there's something to this shit. There's something to it. Right. Whole way back from Lincoln, the next day, we went to the celebration of life. The last thing this woman wrote in her prayer journal before she passed and went on to, to God was before she went unconscious. This is the last thing she wrote was, thank you, God, for always being here. And I thought to myself, holy cow, that's what I want. I want right. that. I'm missing it. The whole way back, I couldn't get enough info. I just, what do we do? How do we do this? Where should we be? What, what, you know, what can I do next? And basically, here I, here I am, transformed, right. transformed a year and a half later to where everything that I've been through in the last year and a half, which has been a lot, with a divorce and with health issues, it just kind of, I know God has my back. So, so I'll tell you why. Today, I get, I, I ordered an Uber to come over to your place. Right. The first guy cancels. Okay. Second guy picks me up, walks in. He says, hey, I got something for you. I don't say, I, haven't, I didn't say anything to this guy. He hands me a daily bread book, which is yeah, yeah. gospel scripture readings. Okay, yeah. scriptures, right? And he says, I just wanted you to have this. How you doing? Starts talking to me. You doing okay? I know, you, you know you're looking like you're a little tired. Whatever. And I'm thinking to myself, who are you? I said to him, who are you? You know me? He goes, no. He goes, I just, uh, I just had a feeling that I had to pick you up today. He drops me off. I mean, we spent 15 minutes together. Powerful. God has done that. He has given me his favor in my life as I move forward. Right. And I just want to, I want to just radiate to that, like how important that is to me and how that has changed my life. So when I sit 
and I get the platform like this, which I'm so thankful that you you agreed. I know we had back and forth to get this scheduled. Yeah. But I just want you to know how important this is to me and how valuable this is to my life and how valuable this is to be able to talk about this story. And hopefully there's two or three people or 10 people or one person out there that hears this and says, damn, I want to make a difference in my life. Right. And I, I just had to, I had to tell you that uh, because I think it's an important part of my testimony um, going through the trials and, and the tribulations that I've had in the last year and a half. This is a good answer. You know, God is a good answer. And all the things that we do in our life, they're all kind of washed. As long as we look and say, yeah, I believe that there's, there's a higher power. And for me, it's Jesus Christ. And I can walk that walk with him. Um, I don't know, you know, I, there are people out there that are listen to this and say, this guy's full of shit because we always have that. Yeah, yeah. There's people out there that say, hey, he saved my life today. Yeah. And that's kind of what I want to do. So all glory to God. Um, that's where I'm at. Well, I think... I think it's a touchy subject, but I, th I think that, that what is it? You know, it doesn't hurt. You know what I'm saying? Like, like I, the listen. Some of the most miserable people I know, uh, my my uh, uh, Bozak, John Bozak. You met him? Yes. Miserable. Total atheist. Doesn't believe. Doesn't want to hear it. Um, gets irritated. He is very unhappy. Mm -hmm. Um. My wife, who's been through thick and thin, just been through, uh, if, you know, if you, if you think about someone raised in a meth, a meth you know, methamphetamine environment, right? Everybody's mm. on meth. Everybody's mm. in and out of prison. I mean, you think about every horrible thing mm. that can happen to a 12-year-old girl has happened. So you think about that, you know, and yet she's got a great attitude. Mm. But she also, you know is a huge believer in God. Uh, you know, we go to, you know, a church on Sunday, not every Sunday, most Sundays. And I started going, you know, my mom fucking rock, bro rock. And I mean, just went Amen through shit. Yeah. I mean, just through, just husbands and alcoholic four fucking kids, you know, just a, a horrific situation for her. Um, you know, my dad, not a believer, miserable, miserable, never could get a hold of his addictions, mm. you know? Mm. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it's like, it, even if you're wrong, it's so overwhelming to me. Like, I think even if I'm wrong, it's so overwhelmingly comfortable. Yes. What does it fucking matter? Yes. Like, so you're wrong. Well, then yes. I'm in the same position as the guy who didn't believe his whole life. Right. But I'll tell you what, I'm going to have a better attitude. Than no that doubt. Guy. I'm going to live my life I, better. Yeah, I, exactly. I feel better. I feel like I make better decisions. I feel like I have, and sometimes it's almost like being in prison, making a bunch of plans, not knowing how I'm going to get, this is where I want to go. And I need to do something every day towards that. Mm. I don't know how I'm going to get there, mm. but I'm going to try. Yeah. And if I never get there, that's okay. Yeah. So that's, yeah. that's kind of how, how, how I feel. Yeah, like, I love that. Right. It's just faith. Yeah. I, it's, I think it'll work out. Yeah. And if it doesn't work out, that's okay. Yeah. That's, that's right. Okay. So it's okay. You it's know? funny whenever we go to church, uh, whenever Jess and I go to church, and we used to go to a church, a great church, which was in, is in um, is in uh, is it? It's Bradenton. I was going to say Sarasota mm -hmm. in Bradenton. Anyway, mm -hmm. so we used to go there, but now it's it's, it's an hour and thirty minute drive, bro, mm -hmm. and maybe an hour and forty five mm -hmm. minutes. So it's like if you want to go to church, that's yeah. your whole day. Yeah. Yeah. That it, it's hands down the best church, but we just found another one that's actually in Wesley Chapel, tiny. But, but really good. You know, I never go there thinking about, you know, praying or worshiping God. I just go there to kind of just listen. Mm. I never leave there not feeling better mm. about having God. Does that make sense? Oh, that you makes know, perfect sense. You walk sense. out and I just feel better about yeah. it. I don't have to believe sense. in everything that this person is saying. But overall, I never really hear anything I don't agree with. Either does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. So, man, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. it is. You know, and it's it's like um, for me, the church I go to is is run by a former uh, Michigan State wrestler. He's awesome. Uh, right. He talks the talk and walks the walk. And um, you know, there there was something, and I go to men's group, which I think is helpful too. They, they right. talk about being in the Word, you know, praying, and then having fellowship. 
right? So I think that's what you're talking about is yeah. sitting there is fellowship. Right. Even if you're not participating, you are participating because you're part of their testimony, their, right. their trial, you know? And uh, he said th- th- this one line that my, the head of my men's group say, I think about it all the time, forgiven people forgive people. Something we don't do. Right. And we are forgiven, you know? So why can't we forgive others? Why do we get hung up on stupid shit? Every day in life, you know, and that changed my perspective on even, even like with my family, here's the biggest thing. Like my kids have noticed a difference to, to the point where they're like, Oh, Jesus freak. We got a Jesus freak, you know, whatever. Right. And you know what? I, I thank God for that because I'm like, yeah, that's exactly right. And they're noticing a change. Right. Right. So if I can bring that to their life, cause I didn't do a great job the first 59 years, you right. know, or the first, their first 33 right. and 30 respectively, you know, didn't right. do a great job. Excuse me. But now I do, and I think that's part of it is forgiven people forgive people. And and the biggest person you could forgive is yourself, you know, yeah. is just say, yeah, I made a lot of stupid mistakes. I did a lot of stupid things. I live differently, and I'm willing to, to live this way. And I'm not willing to roll the dice that there isn't something that exists after. And it translates to the business world. It translates to this conversation. It translates to the guy picking me up. You know, the Uber guy picking me up and the guy last night driving me to the airport said it was the same guy. It was another guy that we talked about religion. He's like, yeah, I'm a believer. You know, I changed my life. I was a raging alcoholic on Wall Street. And right. now I'm good. Oh, look, and can you imagine how many, how many, like, it's funny how, how many of these guys go through these like rehabs and stuff, but the ones that have the best outcome are the faith-based ones. You know, always, even if you're wrong, yeah. it, 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 you know, what does it matter? Like right. it, there's no harm in it. No harm in it. So it's a better lived life I for you. Yeah. For you yourself. And you bring more to other people by, by forgiving yourself. So I don't want to be a one upper. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So that's not me. This is not me being a one upper. It's just something. I love it. It's just something that that it's a story that I'm gonna tell you real quick. Yeah, and I'm gonna it. cry, so you'd be okay. I'll probably that. cry too. That's fine. Wait, um, no, I'm FBI. I can't cry. Sorry. Right. Well, you're not as emotionally emotionally damaged as I am. Um. So, uh. But so here I got a story. When I was a mortgage broker. Well, when I was becoming a mortgage broker. What you know? T- how uh, old were you? This is two thousand. This is. Oh God! How, when was I? Two thousand and uh, no, I'm, I'm sorry, two thousand. What am I saying, bro? It's like nineteen ninety nine. Let's say I think I got my license in ninety nine. I could be wrong. Might have been ninety eight or ninety nine. Anyway, so I go with my girlfriend, who's a stripper, and she met a guy at the strip club, mm. and he wants her to become a mortgage broker, come work for his thing. She says, "Hey, you should be a mortgage broker. You should, you should come with me. We could do this." She was already working there for a while, mm. um, so. We go and we we go to Jim Montram's National um, Mortgage Origination School, right? It's one of the biggest mortgage broker training schools. Okay. So in Florida, you have to go. You have to go to a, a class first. Like it's like a, I forget how many hours it is. It's like a twenty four hour course or something. Whatever. You have to go to the course. You have to pass the course. Then that and that's once you get your little certificate, you can apply and you can sign up for the te- the state test. Okay. Then you go do the state test. So that's cool. So I go with her and we go the first day, we're there, whatever it is, six or eight hours, you know, we're, we're, well, we weren't, we, we went that night, we went a Friday night, it starts at like six. So we go there for a few hours. Then the next day you show up at like, let's say nine and then it's, it's noon. Mm. So at noon, and I want to say it was the first day, maybe it was the second day, we see the instructor, Jim Mantra, and he's sitting over there at we're at some restaurant close to, you know, where the, they have it like, you know, they have like a hotel where they rent mm-hmm. out a fucking room. Um, so we're there. There's probably 40 people in there. And there's okay. 40 people. There's 20 of them went to this restaurant. He's there sitting, eating by himself. And I am not the kind of guy that feels bad for someone. Mm. Okay. Especially at this time of my life, it was, I was only concerned about me. And um, I looked over at him and I went, that's the instructor. And my girlfriend's like, right. And I went, let's go eat with him. And she goes, why? And I went, I don't know. I feel bad for him. I said, he's just sitting there. I said, probably nobody ever eats with him. She goes, nobody wants to eat with the instructor. She goes, nobody wants to eat with the teacher. Nobody wants to. And I went, why? I said, he seems okay. She goes, he doesn't seem okay. And I went, 
I feel bad for him. Let's go sit with him. And she goes, oh, my God, come on, get your, come on, get up, get, get your stuff, let's go. So we, she's like, oh, God. So we go over there. We, I go, hey, I said, you're in the instructor. And she's like, he's like, yeah, hey, what's up? You're, I said, yeah, yeah, I'm one of the students. I said, can we eat with you? And he goes, he said, I've been doing this 10 years. He said, I eat here every time. He said, nobody's ever asked to eat with me. And I said, really? And I sit down. We sit down. We have lunch. Mm. Maybe the next day we had lunch with him, too. I don't recall for sure. We had this lunch. We talked for like an hour or so. He's like, God, we got to get back. You know, we go. Uh, we go back, finish the class, whatever. I end up getting my certificate. I go the next, I go a couple days later, take the test. I'm a mortgage broker. So I go on, go to work for this company. You know the rest of the story, right? Yes. Horrific, right? So get to a point. I go to prison. Um, my first... You know, when I first get arrested, I, of course, you know, um, cooperate. That doesn't do any good. I am interviewed by Dateline. Government doesn't want to give me anything for that. I'm interviewed by American Greed. Government doesn't want to do anything for that. I get a letter in the mail from Jim Montrum and says, I don't know if you remember me or not. Hmm. Now, keep in mind, I've now been locked up. Six years, almost seven years. There were, there were three years on the run, and there was about four or five years. This is about 10 to 12 years after, after that had, lunch, after that course. Right. And he says, you had lunch with me. Hmm. He said, and I recall, he goes through this whole thing. I remember the first time I saw you in, uh, first time I saw you in the newspaper. I remembered your name. I looked you up, and sure enough, it was you. I looked up on my schedule, it was you, or my uh, my old old uh, records, and it was you. Hmm. Watched you, read all the articles. He said the entire economy by this point had collapsed. Right, two thousand and this now looks like two thousand eight. Yeah, and yep. he said two thousand eight, two thousand nine. Uh, Dodd Frank goes into into law. They've got a year or two before all these national schools. Now every mortgage broker in the country has to have continuing education. Mm. He said, we teach the continuing education courses. We write the courses where I'm the largest national um, uh, school. And I would love to write a course uh, for ethics and fraud with you because I've looked and looked. You're the only fraudster out there that I can find that actually was licensed as a broker, owned a brokerage business, and then has committed, as far as I can tell, he said pretty much every version of, there's about 10 basic frauds, mm -hmm. every single one of them in some capacity. And I think you'd be an ideal for this. Mm. And he's, and I went, so I, I call, he said, can you call me? I call him. He says, Matt, um, I said, look, can you call my lawyer? And I said, because I think maybe this could be used. Maybe I could, something could happen. Yeah, definitely. For me, because this is something definitely. they would want me to do. I said, I'm going to do it no matter what. But he said, I, I am going to absolutely call your lawyer. Calls my lawyer, calls the U.S. attorney, schedules a meeting. He drives up, has a meeting with the U.S. attorney and my lawyer, like does everything. He could have just said, okay, well, let me know. Yeah, right. Like tell your lawyer to call. No, he says, no, I want to drive up and talk to her. I want to convince her that this is a good thing. I want this guy to get help. I want him to get something off his sentence. Now, of course, you know that once I wrote that course, now the U.S. Yeah. attorney comes back and says, absolutely, we'll reduce your sentence for this. Now, of course, she doesn't reduce my sentence for it. But in the end, what the way my Rule 35 was written up, because there was no arrests for my cooperation, they, the way it was written up was Mr. Cox was interviewed by Dateline. He was interviewed by these people, but the the main focus was he wrote an ethics and fraud course, which is used to train the nation's mortgage brokers mm -hmm. that over 100,000 mortgage brokers or something at that point, by the time we forced them to go to uh, uh, get me back and reduce my sentence. So, you know, one really odd act of kindness on my part, not seven years off my sentence. Like it was like it was so... Like my, you, the, I remember my girlfriend's re, re, look at, re, reaction to me was like, "What are you like? Yeah, why are we doing this? Like, yeah. this is not you." Yeah, and and yeah. usually I just I just felt like, no, I think we should sit with him. I don't know why. I don't care. I don't want to sit with the teacher. Yeah. I want to eat my dinner or my lunch. I want to go back. I want to get this over with. But I was like, you know. And so I go and seven powerful, years, man. right? That's powerful. So that decision changed your life. It's funny too because and that guy took it to heart. 
That guy did, oh, yeah, what, he, did oh, what he said he was going to do, which, let's face it, how he, many people do that? Oh, listen, no he, one. Had to, he had to come see me because yeah. he had to come see me several times yeah. um, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the visitation room. And then he, he came several times after that. He would come like every year or two. Hey, I was driving by. I thought I might as well stop by. Wow. And you know what it's like being, going to a prison. You're not stopping by. Yeah. It's a fucking, it's an it's hour a and a half process to get in. Absolutely. It's, it's horrible. They treat you like dog crap. Then it's, you got to get out. It's. So, yeah, good, good guy. Dude, and that and is awesome. I love that. Yeah, that that decision. I mean, do you remember anything more than just, hey, I want to go sit with this guy? Was there anything else that kind of just happened? No, it just was something, it, something. And it was out of character. It was extremely out. of Listen, I, I remember it was so out of character because my the, my girlfriend was just like, what are you? Yeah, this like, isn't you. What are you like? Yeah. You don't like you're not an overly friendly person at that time, especially at that time of my life. Like, I mean, mm. I went to prison and, you know, everything and I and just kind of curbed my, um, you know, I, I think just my outlook on life in general, you know, mm. going through prison, going through everything and thinking, you know, if you have a, a second chance. Yep, absolutely. You might want to yeah. stop being an asshole. <laughs> it's not working out. <laughs> Society's decided they don't want you in society anymore. Maybe you should go another route. Yeah. Yep. So that how's that working out for you? Yeah, Approach. Yeah. Way better. Like yeah. just having a good outlook. And, and I tell it, it's funny, I tell this to my wife all the time. Somebody will text me and I'll text them back. And I'll text this person back and I'll say something good about this person. Or I'll talk on the phone to some guy who's Man, can I just talk to you? Mm. I, I, you know, I like, and it's, I don't think it's, sometimes it's like spiritually based. Like somebody will be like, look, I'm, I'm having problems. And then they'll mention God during the conversation. Yeah. But most of the time it's like some young kid who's like, I don't know what to do in life. Mm. I don't know this. I don't know. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And, you know, my wife is always kind of like, it, it's not that she's like, why are you doing that? Because she's not. Because she's like, I think it's great that you do it. Mm. But she definitely, the person that showed up and she met in the halfway house, she's like, I, I would have never expected you to go out of your way for anybody. You were so aggressive when you got to the halfway house. So, you know, I always say assertive, but so driven. So, you know, I don't have any time for that. I don't have time for this. And this is what yep. I'm doing right now. Yep. And, and I still feel like that. And I'm like, well, you know, I said, let me put it into a perspective that you could probably look at as being something that I might be thinking. This will make you feel better, make, make you feel better about the scumbag you married <laughs> is that I'm like, you never know what's going to happen. You know, you, you, you don't right. Yeah, a a random don't. act of kindness can come back to you tenfold. Now I'm not doing it for that, but I do lots of things all the time. I talk to people, I respond to emails, I respond to comments. I tell people, I know, you know, I things that's important. It, 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 look, even if you want to say, okay, well, you're a selfish prick. Okay, well, great. Then I'm a selfish prick. Yep. I'm trying to do it. Why? Cause it makes me feel good about me. So hopefully it helps him, but you know maybe primarily it's just because it makes me feel good. And that's okay. And that's okay yourself. because you don't yep. know what's going to happen with that guy. I got guys that comment with me and talk about in the comments that will say they talked to me on the phone and I didn't have there was no reason or you know I helped them fix their credit for no reason or they they've got seven hundred fifty credit scores they're buying a house because they talked to me three years ago on the phone after seeing me on concrete or whatever like dude it's like it takes me five it takes me three fucking minutes i know and it feels good and again it's that forgiven people forgive people that's right. what it is man you know it's big time on that side it, it truly is and you know i i think that this kind of stuff helps people you know and i think that's yeah. why they're reaching out to you because they, they do need help and they're not sure exactly what part of their life they need help in well you know it's funny because in the comments every ever for every guy that says something negative about oh, i don't want to hear about god or i didn't fucking come for that i want to mm -hmm. hear talk to criminals or i want to this mm -hmm. or that. there's there's some guy that's going to leave a comment that's going to be like yo bro yep this helped me Listen, i'm the one right i'm Listen, the one and be a bunch of those ones i had a woman that wrote me um Wrote me an email, but I don't even think I res I don't even know if I responded to this. I know I talked to when I read the email to uh, my wife. Actually, I read it to to uh, Zach too. I read it to Zach. I couldn't even fucking read it without tearing up. Yeah, it's tough. And the guy, she was saying that in the last six weeks or eight weeks, she had had chemo, like twice a week or something. And she goes, and she listens to my podcast, and she said, "You have no idea how much you inspired me to get through." Damn. And she was saying, if you could get through a prison, 
I can get through this. Like a prison is nothing compared to chemo or cancer. Like, what are you talking about? But she was talking about what a good outlook I have and blah, blah, blah. And I was See, just like, that's, that's what there, there it is. Like, I mean, that's, that's it in a nutshell. That's you know? delusional. Like I was, I would think you're going, you've got cancer. Like, Oh my God. But you know, the fact that she said like, you got me through this, like, yeah, that's nuts, bro. It's nuts, but it's great stuff. I mean, that's why we're doing this. You know, I mean, that's just part of giving back. Oh, I remember. And you don't even think about it. You know, like yeah. like you said, like you're looking. How many how many people look at comments? Like I know I know you do. I know Julian does. I know Danny does. And they do. It makes a difference, especially for you know people that are aspiring to do more, right? But just don't think they have a possibility of ever doing more. Yeah. You know, and that's that's the beauty, like getting and and there's different ones that I look at and I'm like, I have to respond to this. You know, I've had that happen already in a year. I've had that people saying, hey, I just want to I want to talk to you about like, you know, life choices. Right. Career path. Right. The FBI, you know, the CIA, uh, the Army. That's beautiful to be able to just do that and help. I never I was the same way. I never would find <laughs> I don't have time for anybody. Everybody's an asshole. You know, this person's an idiot. You know, this person did this. I mean, I don't have time for that. I'm I'm Jim DiOrio. I'm a West Point graduate. I don't need to fucking talk to you. Right. <laughs> you know, that worked out great. You know, right. Truly. Two divorces later and, you know, and, oh, yeah. and a pain in the ass, you know, with my health. So, but we're getting there. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, yeah, yeah, I, got, I, got, I got a life of fucking decisions that have culminated in... Yeah, a kid that won't talk to me. I got fucking. Right. It, it's it's funny. Like I, I got. There's all kinds of things that it's just like I don't even know what I did to this person. This person hates my guts. I don't. Even re- I felt like I was always pretty cool to this person. Mm. You know. It's yeah. Like, no, they just they have yeah. their own reasons, and you know, you're just you just happen to be yeah. that that. Uh, I feel like I probably did something. Uh, like, or know, they're, or they're just projecting, projecting their like shit you. on you. Yeah. You know. Well, I was gonna say, people likely. call you an asshole. You're probably an asshole. You know, you, 40, 50 people like that guy's an asshole. You start to have, <laughs> you have to start have to think like. Yeah, it might be. Yeah. yeah, it could be. Yeah. No, definitely, man. Tell me about, now, that Rule 35, I was thinking about that. We we had talked a little bit about that right. previously. Do I have a snot coming out of my nose? Do I need to go? No, you look okay, good. Okay. You look fine. Yeah. Sorry. I like it. All right. I like it. <laughs> yeah, tell me about 35. What is that again? It's post- Post- uh, Sentencing- Yes. Uh, cooperation credit. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's-, that's uh, I was thinking about a couple of cases I had that started based on that post sentencing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cooperation, you know, going forward. Um, it's Some funny. I ones. I got this guy who's like a YouTuber, TikToker guy who's going to come on in like a month from now, and he mm. was t- asking me. He's like, "Bro," and he's all like jacked up, and his uh, he's all tatted up, and done a bunch of state prison time, and um, he's like. Bro, I want to talk to you about that. I'm like, okay, do you mind talking about it? I said, no. And he said, he said, because I'm super curious about that. Like, how does that work? About the 35. Yeah, about the, and I was, he's like, you know, he's like, and you're the only person I know that's like totally open and would answer my questions because I'm, I'm really curious. I was like, yeah, bro, I got no problem with it. He yeah. said, um, you know, I think I even said, I said, look, and if you're not okay with it, I said, you can tell me that too. Mm. I said, I'm ready to dig in and argue about it. Mm. And he was, he's like, nah, I said, you know, I've never really faced that kind of time. So I don't really judge. He's like, but I never, never did anything like that. I think he said, but honestly, he said, I, he said, honestly, he said, I, I was going to a place where guys stab each other over, over stuff like that. He said, yeah. so he yeah. said, uh, uh, don't, he said, that's, that's not it at all. I'm just really curious. Like, how does it even work? Yeah. So. Well, first you have to have something to offer. So yeah. you got to have yeah. some good info, you know, and, and like you did have great info and look how long it fucking took you yeah, to get not, somebody to listen, you know? God, what what about those fucking choices? Like if I'd stayed in Tampa, I'd have probably gotten five, four or five years. If I just mm-hmm. stayed the first time, like, mm-hmm. no, fuck you guys. Fuck you coppers. <laughs> you know, I'm going to go on the run. You'll never catch me three years later. And then I'm like, okay, well now I want to cooperate. Nope. Now we're having in the middle of a, of a, a meltdown. Mm. And your cooperation is nothing compared to this banker that we're investigating that mm. lost $800 million or this guy made last half a billion dollars. It's like, why are we going after your pittance? Right. You know, so it's like, yeah. oh my God, like my fallback plan doesn't work. Now mm. what? So, like Hell I said, yeah. thank God I sat down. Uh, oh, by the way, you know the other thing? Jim Montram also, yeah, yeah. also at my Rule 35 came. And, uh, and testified spoke on, at my spoke on your behalf. Absolutely, that's pretty cool too. Yeah, he, and he didn't have to. No. Um, so yeah. Uh, oh God, he was so funny. I, I remember my lawyer. Sorry, this is my lawyer. I was like, "Listen, do me a favor. Do not wing this." 
I said, talk to this guy beforehand, get him. I said, explain the question. To, and this is all when I first met her. Okay. Like, this is, it was like four months later before I met, at, I'm actually in the courtroom. And I said, I'm asking you, don't wing it. She says, no, I, I don't wing it. I'm very prepared. I this, I that. I said, okay, I get it because you know you put these guys on the stand. Like I want you to know what to say. I want to. I want to really go. She said, I'd be thorough. Like I really, I can write out the the questions for you and I, if help you. I'd like to see what you want to ask. She's like, absolutely. Just beforehand, I said, have you ever written out any questions? Hmm. And she goes, um, I'm still working on mine. Why don't you send me yours? <laughs> so I send her questions. <laughs> yeah. And she comes back and and so the next day when I'm there. Because she, I kept saying, "Are you coming to see me?" Wait, she was still me? working on hers the day before. No, no, yeah, no, no, okay. no. Like a week before, I'm, I'm at the. So she hadn't done shit. She hadn't done anything. Yeah. So by the time I actually get go to the courthouse now, and I, I'm sitting, I'm like, "What? Do you have anything laid out, planned out?" And she went, "Um, you know, I looked at your questions. I thought they were pretty good. I'm just going to go with yours." And I oh went, "Oh my god!" So she, didn't I said, do "Shit." No, I go. Have you prepared your? prepared anything i said did you talk to jim montram did you talk to the fbi agent she's like no i'm i can go talk to jim now but i i, I feel like he's just going to tell what happened and i was like so she's i i hate to she's i would hate to have anything written down matt because she said i don't want it to seem um seem rehearsed i want it to seem kind of and i went uh, she was it's kind gotta of gotta be rehearsed right you and gotta I, get the points all across and i looked at her and i said so you're just gonna kind of wing it and she goes yeah she goes, well yeah i mean i and she, you could see in her, in her mind, she realized, oh shit, that's what he said last time. And she went, Matt, it's going to be fine. And I was like, uh-huh. She gets Jim Montram on the stand and he sits there and says, uh, he goes through everything that happened. Then, so he's like, oh, listen, it was a, that time, that period of time was the wild west. These guys were doing all kinds, everybody was making W2s, pay stubs. And lots of people were doing these things. Lots of people, this, this, this. So he's like, it was very common, a lot of corruption, especially in subprime loans. And, you know, the, the bankers, he starts talking about the bankers, this, the bankers, that. So then when the U.S. attorney gets on the stand, so he did say, because he had softball questions, she gets him on the stand, she starts talking. She said, so lots of people were making W2s, pay stubs. Absolutely. Absolutely. And he says, uh, um, she said, so lots of people were getting five and six mortgages on their houses, uh, changing deeds, stealing houses, pulling out equity. Um, she said, uh, she said, uh, committing fraud against banks for millions and millions of dollars. And he goes, oh, no, no. He goes, he was way out of line on that. <laughs> was like, oh, my God. Just, just smoked me. I just, well, like, what I was the? like, I went, I looked at her and I go. This is why you don't wing it. Exactly. And she was like, and she sat there, and I, and I said, "You gonna say anything?" She's no, it, it'll be fine. And it's I, my, <laughs> the dude just the guy that's testifying for you just said, "Yeah, that's way out of line." Oh my god! What the fuck? Well, I mean, he didn't mean, you know, he didn't mean no, anything by it. No, but no. He didn't. If she had, if she had said, "Look, yeah, she and, may say," and something he would have like, gotten that response. She would have gotten the response in the rehearsed. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, it would have been fine. No, how funny! You, you know what I was thinking when you said that about the W twos and all the forms. So we had we had a. A public corruption case that a little side portion of the public corruption case was right. this dude. He, he was a local bank bank manager. Right. And he was just a, he was a beaten down man. Like, you know, <laughs> he just wanted a little bit of fun in his life. Right. So part of this corruption case was this this business owner, uh, a builder uh, by by trade. I, eh, I won't even say trade. A builder by name uh, owned a couple strip joints in New Jersey. And part of this banker's kind of help and assistance was, hey, anytime we need a loan for the girls to get breast jobs or anything else, you will be the guy we go to. And they don't have any income on the books. They don't have any collateral. They don't have any job history. Can you make it work? He said, sure, I'll make up, I'll make up the yeah. shit. You know, no problem. So he he became after that the boob. Wayne the boob banker, right? To them, you know. So when we when we actually went and approached him, and he had done, I mean, he had, and, he, and what, what was he getting like a hand job here, a blow job right. here, whatever it was, right? At the end, and a couple hundred bucks shoved in his sport coat, you know, at one Friday night when he was boozing it up and spending it there anyway. So when we went to approach him, and it was a huge case, but this was just a side, but we had to go with it. Went to approach him, he's like, "What's this about?" You know, trying to play. A, I go, "Hey, we just wanted to say hello to the boob banker." And right. he just turned white. Man. He just started sweating. So we're like, you're going to give it up now? He goes, yeah, but it was only for about 35 or 40 girls. That's all I did to, to, to the tune. And I said, what what tit job is is 
15000 25000 $35,000 back in 1998? No. None. No. Yeah, so what were you doing? $4,500. What were you doing with the other, you know, ten or fifteen or twenty thousand? He goes, "Well, I gotta live." Oh my god! So it was like, bro, I would just shut your mouth if I were you, and not <laughs> say another word. And uh, you know, you're being charged now with with this bank fraud. So it was it was unbelievable. But I was thinking about you know just and he had every every file was papered perfectly, same W two format, you know, the same oh. kind of uh, you know um, rent agreements and leases and all the shit that they needed to, to qualify for the job. Yeah, and nobody ever made a payment, and the bank had actually wound up. It was Shrewsbury State Bank in New Jersey. It actually wound up closing that branch based on the fact that he was doing it all over the state and no one knew about it. So we just opened up the door to that happening. But it was it was phenomenal. The case was amazing. It was a guy named Anthony Spolero who, who's since passed. But I think one of the funniest stories about Spolero, so Spolero was paying off politicians basically to get approvals for housing developments all over New Jersey. And some of the towns that he worked in are now so absolutely saturated with homes and the tax base is nothing. And so the, the towns are like basically falling apart, you right. know, and so now you have traffic, infrastructure's not prepared for it, the schools are overrun, all based on this guy, you know, doing it. But but some of the some of the funniest things I think during his uh sentencing kind of um hearing, which as you know, sentencing hearings, maybe maybe 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes at most because everything's right. worked out. His was almost three and a half hours because he had conditions supposedly that were going to send him up to either Fort Devens, Mass, in the hospital, in, in the Bureau of Prisons hospital facilities, medical facility, right. or he was going to just sit at home and get treated. He had all kinds of – he had Parkinson's – supposedly he had Parkinson's and low – infraction ejection fraction in his heart and all this kind of it was like he's banging everything he shook through the whole thing like purposely and we had one of the best i think one of the best best defense attorneys in the country michael critchley out of new jersey critchley was questioning the doctor who was in charge of the fort devon's uh medical facility for bureau of prisons he was the guy he was the guy that made all the decisions critchley two hours he crossed this guy about, well, what would you do if he does this and this happens? What kind of medication would you have? And the guy finally, like, the, after two hours, the guy said, I don't know. I, I don't know. He said, are you even a doctor? And the guy said, I think so. <laughs> and I, I just looked at my partner and said, you know, this guy's not going to jail, yeah. right? He goes, yeah, absolutely. And Spolero was doing his shaking. And finally, the judge just, Ann Thompson, she, a great judge. She's, okay, listen, um, you know, we're not going to send you to prison, Mr. Yeah, Spolero. We're going to just, yeah, whatever. And he, the shaking stopped, and he said, oh, thank you very much. And he just got up and walked out. <laughs> it's a classic. <laughs> and we were like, Spolero. Um, and then we had part of that, too. He the, the one place where he ran all of the stuff out of was this place called Heartbreakers down in the Jersey, the Jersey Shore area. Right. And supposedly, oh, it's run club? properly. Yeah, it's yeah. run properly. There's no I – mean, and his, his manager, this dude, Greg Russo, Greg Russo is telling us, listen, we don't mess around here. You know, there's no nudity. There's nothing going on. This is just entertainment for guys who are trying to burn off some, you know, excess energy and have a couple of cocktails and just kind of look at, you know, we have a liquor license, so they can't do this. They can't do that. So we're like, okay. And we're up in his office and he's looking at cameras. Hold on one minute. You know, let me look. Let me see here. Yep. None of that. None of that silly stuff goes on. All of a sudden, there's a knock at the door, right? And he says, come in, two naked strippers. And they're like, it's lunchtime, Greggy. <laughs> and he just said, oh, shit, that wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> so I'm like, so, Greg, you're not doing any of that crap up here? You know, full of shit? And so it just, like, that that case was unreal. And it, it turned into a huge case. Um, I mean, we wind up putting almost 67 politicians away oh, wow. and a whole bunch of uh, rabbis who were laundering cash for – what we believe this at the time shocking. was cartel time. So, yeah, in Brooklyn, Brooklyn cash houses. We hit a Brooklyn cash house. Um, it was like seven and a half million. And the, and the guy who was doing it, the rabbi who was there in charge of it said, you should have hit me yesterday. I had like 28 million. We're like, you're not really supposed to say that. You know, and there he is. He's like, don't touch me. You're not supposed to touch me. You know what I mean? Because I'm a man of the cloth. I go, laundering, <laughs> laundering, laundering money. money. He's like, yeah, but don't touch me anyway. So when we arrested that dude, when we put the handcuffs on him, you know, he said, hey, you can't touch me. So all right, put the handcuffs on yourself. So he did. He put the handcuffs on. I could tell right away he put them on too tight. Right. So he looks at me. He's like, these, I said, I can't, can't touch, touch you, bro. you, bro. Yeah. 
just like turning blue his fingers oh. and turning blue. I finally had to take him off. But just so much funny shit, you know, going on in jars, getting a, a little, um, you know, I was thinking about just a bunch of cases when you were talking, you know, just some good stuff. Bob Torricelli, the senator from New Jersey. Right. Crazy. I mean, a guy got off a couple days before. We were going to, we were actually going to indict him several days after not the Thursday after the Tuesday of 9 11, the 13th of September. And Mary Jo White, who was the U.S. Attorney in New York for the Southern District, she said, "Look, I can't, I can't indict a sitting U.S. Senator like why this building is burning." Right. You know. And in the meantime, you look at the proofs we had, everything that we had going on. Great. I mean, we had a very accurate informant who just was crazy. So it was difficult for anyone to believe him. But every time he said something. It was corroborated easily. Right. And I think one of the best ones is he, he calls us up. He goes, and listen, there's a guy, a garbage guy in Bergen County, New Jersey, that is famous for putting me in the wood, putting people in wood chipper, and they just disappear. And he just, I just saw him at 7-Eleven up in Fort Lee, New Jersey. I was making my coffee. I was in there. I put hazelnut cream. I was stirring the coffee. In comes Senator Torricelli. Bob Torricelli comes in. He's got his jet jacket on. He's telling us this whole thing. You know, he pours, pours in the creamer, and he says, eh. and next thing you know, Jimmy Dimitrakis comes in. He's going to take me, throw me in the garbage truck, and then throw me in a wood chipper because I'm cooperating. And they know I'm cooperating. And we're like, my boss looks at me. He goes, dude, you, you got to go up and straighten this out. This guy's lying. This is why we never going to be able to to use him right so no problem so we go up to the 7-eleven and i'm like hey you guys by chance have video you know stuff they go yeah absolutely we keep it for 24 hours all right i'll grab you a subpoena whatever no nah, just take it look at it so they make us a copy go back to the office now the cooperator david chang he's kind of kneeling down in front of the tv looking and we plug the thing in and here right. comes the video do you know exactly there he is he goes there i am stirring my coffee <laughs> Hazelnut. Here comes Bob. It was exactly what happened. They're trying to pull him out. There's a garbage truck parked in front. It was oh. insane. So, you know, here, yeah, here's yeah. a sitting U.S. senator fucking looking to, you know, whack witnesses. Yeah. Back and they never got charged. And now he's he's working for the EPA. He he basically oh. does all the, the Superfund um, cleanups. So court ordered, federally court oh ordered God. Superfund cleanups. You can imagine how that's He's going. in charge of that. Yeah. So my, he's, he's my a 10% guy. My buddy's company gets this guy. My buddy's company, this buddy's company gets this He gets this 800K contract. for just saying, hey, I'm going to give this to so-and-so, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Never, never really, you know, was censored, basically was slapped on the wrist by, by the Senate and told not to run again. That was like a party decision. He was a Democrat from New Jersey, longtime sitting U.S. senator there. Right. You're not going to... Not a chance. Yeah. You know, you're not going to be able to run again, but you're not going to get touched. And we had his defense attorney, Ted Wells, who's one of the most famous defense attorneys. He did a bunch of different, a bunch of high upper level politicians who he defended along right. the way. We allowed Ted Wells to walk around the search warrant of Bob Torricelli's home in Inglewood, New Jersey. We allowed him to walk with the attachment B. So seeing exactly what we were looking for. Right. Here it is. He, he was walking with me. He would walk up and go, holy cow, this is exact. I've never seen corroboration like this on a search warrant. Like this, this guy's done. And this is his own attorney. Yeah. The, the best part was all these custom made suits in his closet. Chang had explained exactly what order they're going to be in by color. Here's what's going to be. This is going to be the plaid one. I said, David, how do you know that? He goes, because my tailor from Bergen County would come down into the congressional dining hall and measure Torricelli. And basically say, and the way Torricelli would just say, hey, I like that pattern you have on today. Right. Give me two of those. Give me three of those. There they were. Like, I'm talking $2,000 suits in 1999. Yeah. That were just lined up in his closet, 50 or 60 of them. Cash handed in newspapers to him. But the Two Mercedes Benz. That the, the, the informant seemed insane. It seemed insane. Yeah. So, and then he winds up, we wind up putting him in, he had to go to jail. He had to do his part. Um, we show up at his... His plea, and we tell him, and he had a strong Korean accent. We tell him, David, they're going to go through this. You have to answer these questions. Now, this is stuff we already talked about, right? Right. And we had this com campaign finance task force, two AUSAs, two federal prosecutors that had come up to just do this case. They were there for two and a half years with us. Listen, we're going to ask these questions. It's a, it's a little embarrassing because you got to admit to doing things. Nope, I'm fine. I am fine, he says. I am fine. 
Um, we sit down, do, start doing the thing. Uh, David, did you do this? Did you, David, uh, did you commit obstruction of justice? And, and the thing was, you know, basically when we went in to search his place, originally he had shredded some documents. Mm -hmm. So we have to have that, David, because it's important for the charge against the senator. Right. If we don't have the obstruction, it's going to be really difficult for us to charge the senator. No problem. No problem. As soon as they asked that, he, he gets up. Who said that? Who said I commit that? And he just starts freaking out. So the, one of the lawyers just closes his briefcase and goes, we are going to trial. <laughs> he starts like walking out. Then finally Chang kind of got under control and we kind of explained to him, hey man, you know, you got to take this plea. Okay, let's do it. He says, let's do a do over. So, well, it's not the way it works. So we got to come back another point. <laughs> and do, he says, well, I'll do a do over, you know, not a problem. But then he became so like, he, he became very paranoid about the Senator trying to do things like yeah. kill him, and you know, there's there's people putting bombs on my lawn. So once that happened, we're like, shit, we're not going to be able to pass this case along. But we we were going to indict it. We were going to in indict a sitting U.S. senator based on ex great corroboration. Like we had independent sources that were saying that's exactly what happened. Right. Like legit people, exactly what happened. So it's just interesting how when you think the, the, the spectrum of the world or the way the history of the world and the timing of things, yeah. how some things just go yeah. away and some things they continue to say or we continue to say so focused. Yeah, just like the, the they would have gone and swept up 12 or 15 of my co-conspirators, right. except... There's the it's the middle of the financial crisis. There you go. So so, so it didn't want right. didn't, didn't want to show that there's a bigger issue than they didn't want to make out a bigger issue, which was a bigger issue, right? Because they wanted to kind of keep things under. Did they? The, you know, in, the, sorry, did you guys end up giving him cooperation? We did. So his sentence was went from 120 months down to like 36 months, but he died in jail. Oh, he died geez. of liver cancer. That sucks. So he died, you know, young guy. I mean, really had, um, he had, and, and the thing, this is the best part. So the way the senator, the, the way the senator got him to pay to those bribes in the graph that he provided was he told him, so Chang had always said, there, I had a Korean, or I had a uh, grain deal with North Korea. Okay. So we're like, dude, you never had that. Right. You know, it's impossible. Nope, I had it, and we were going to find, uh, you know, missing and the guys that were missing in action from Korean War. Uh, I had this whole deal, and the set, and, and they said, "Well, how, who who made you? Who told you that that was true? Like, who told you that that happened?" Senator Torricelli. He said he had connections in North Korea. He could make that happen. All I had to do was pay him. That's. I was going to say that's like the. Um, that's like the the the. the the um, councilman that I got fucking elected to uh, with him, he ends up getting hooked up or getting indicted on a bribery charge. Mm -hmm. And he was taking bribes from a guy telling him he could get his tow truck company, the tow truck um, contract for Hillsborough County. You have nothing to nothing do with to the tow. Do with it. That's like the, the sheriff um, has to do with that. Absolutely. Has nothing to do with you. Nothing. You're, you're a counselor over here, or, you know, you're, and he just, but the guy, they're, they're paying him all this money. Absolutely. What so he's he saying, I'm, oh, I think I can do it. I could stop him having meetings or whatever. Oh, and he then, was saying it was like basically his decision. I'll absolutely. make a phone call. It'll happen. Absolutely. It's like a lulling issue. You know, even, even thinking back, so many of those things had happened. Like we had uh, a guy named Harvey Smith, who was a Jersey City, New Jersey council person who we jammed up, same kind of thing taking money, predicated taking money. We wind up paying him three or four times. Solomon Dweck, who was a longtime source for the Bureau, um, we wind up paying him several times. He goes to trial. At trial, he gets he gets acquitted at trial because the jury said, well, um, I, I mean, I, we didn't really believe he could do what he said he could do, so how could we find him guilty? Because you know, he's taking bribes he to took, do it. took bribes to do it, and then not only that, we, we asked when we pulled the jury, what about him jumping on the phone and talking to the commissioner of the Department of Transportation at New Jersey? Right. So he's trying to get away. Like he's talking to the person. Right. So you don't even need that for it to be a crime. Right. All you need to do is him say, I'll agree that I'll do that and return for some type of cash. Well, in the way the money was flicked into his car, you That's know, nuts. the the basically the prosecutor said it was a forward like in with the envelope, but we saw it on the video, it wasn't really just kind of dropped it. 
dude, he's it doesn't matter money. how he got the money. Well, so that's just when a good defense attorney comes in. Oh, dude, and there would be so many times. This guy, Michael Critchley, same guy. I would sit and I, I, I was crossed by him probably six or seven times. Scared the shit out of me every time, and, and I don't get easily befuddled. I was like stammering. Right. Um, but during Critchley's openings, at my case that I had worked on for you know two years. Every day of my life, there were times in the opening when I'd, I'd be like, oh, shit, maybe this guy didn't do it. <laughs> I mean, that is a powerful fucking piece, right? Maybe maybe this – is it possible this guy didn't do it? When I knew – I mean, I had tapes and video and everything else. It just was amazing how he would walk you down that path. Same thing with he did the doctor. You know, here's a guy that's a distinguished member of the co medical community that's saying, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm a doctor. <laughs> Basically, and I'm thinking, holy crap, you know, it's amazing. It's funny, know? at Coleman, the doctors that they have at the Bureau of Prison, like we used to say the leading cause of, of the leading cause of death at Coleman was medical. <laughs> like, I mean, they, they, they gave so many people the wrong medicine or didn't oh. give them the medicine they were supposed to get or said, wait till tomorrow, wait till tomorrow. And the guy died that night oh because he God. had an asthma attack because they wouldn't give him his inhaler. Oh. Um, I mean, it was like, oh, yeah, it's tomorrow. Tomorrow, bro, I'm going to have an asthma attack. Here. Exactly. I'm, I'll be I, dead tomorrow. I'll be dead tomorrow. And they're like, you'll be fine. You'll be fine tomorrow. Yeah. We looked. You're at a level such and such. Uh, that's not that bad. It's the top. It's the top one. What are you talking about? I need about? it now. Like, yeah. And uh, yeah. But. Anyway, I think, you know, what's funny is I've known like a bunch of people who obviously have gone in the military mm -hmm. and they're all going in and they always think, well, they're going to train me and mm -hmm. then I'll get out and I'll have all these job skills. And it's like, you're, you're really not like your, your you're job really skills not. are law enforcement, corrections, um, you know, that those are your, that's what they're training. Well, no, no, no I'm going to do this. I understand. But the, but the systems that they're using are typically kind of antiquated, right? Yeah. Like they don't move as quickly as. Well, it's hard to translate it, right? I mean, right. it's hard to translate. Well, I, you know, I fired a, a howitzer 155 right. round downrange for three years. But even, even if okay. they're doing something technical like communications, yeah. the equipment's still not, it's not the updated equipment that, so you're being it's, retrained. Exactly. Which, and, it, and it's people skills, man. Like, you know, the, anything else. You don't else, need a ton the, of people skills. The leadership. It's the leadership right. side. You yep. know, coming out of the military. For me, West Point, mm -hmm. um, the people that I stood shoulder to shoulder with there right, and understanding their skills and kind of taking some of what they did and kind of placing it into my holster. Right. And then also providing what I could, um, you know, to say, hey, here's a better way to do things. That has led us down a great path. Like the class of 1986 is a powerful class within the service academy community, within the West Point community. I mean, we have, we go everywhere from Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, who is my Beast Barracks roommate, which is the first six weeks at West Point. Um, that was great. I mean, amazing guy, funny as hell. Uh, and... You know, here, I mean, very well could run for president in the next 10 years. Um, you had dudes like Steve Cannon, who ran Mercedes-Benz, right. a great friend. Joe DePinto, who's 7-Eleven's CEO. Uh, some incredible leaders in, in the military, you know, three, four-star generals who led divisions in combat. So when I look at that, that's what I kind of garnered in. And I took that, translated that over to federal law enforcement. And it worked out nicely. You know, it really did. Um, and I knew that corporate America, I, I just didn't feel it. I never really felt it. Even, get, even retiring from the FBI, you know, I had some job opportunities to be a chief security officer at a big company. Right. I looked at it. I was like, holy shit. I mean, I, I'm going to be miserable. You know, nine to five doing the same thing. Hey, we really should do a security audit. Hey, you know, there's some, hey, don't piggyback. When you have your badge, make sure you close the door behind right. you. Oh, yeah, I want to spend years doing that. Who, you know, was, please, help say, me out. Who was it we inter I interviewed that, uh, was it was it an FBI agent? that When they retired, they went to a, a little tiny sheriff's, went and worked mm. for like a sheriff, little sheriff's mm. down. I think that was uh, the guy who lives down in like Fort Myers. He, he, the guy who introduced you to Raymond Hicks, was that him? Um, yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, and he was like, he's like, like, bro, I came from the FBI. Or no, it was, it was U.S. Marshals. He's like, he came from the U.S. Marshals. He's like, from he said, and now you're, you've got forty guys. He's like, yeah. you know, and, and then he's like, so I, I just, he said, I mean, I did it for like six months. I was like, I just can't do this. Yeah, he's like, and you I, know it, right? And, and he, you so, know it right away, right? You, you know, you do. And I think for me, um, just the process of those interviews to like talk to people about what. And I'm not I'm not discounting anybody's passion and what right. they do, but 
to think about, you know, hey, we're missing, you know, four uh, pallets of copy paper right. this month, and you better get on that shit, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm going to jump on that, right. you know? And, and I'm going to be happy about it. You know, I just, it, it wasn't me. Um, it wasn't me, especially off of some of the stuff I had done in the Bureau, some of the stuff I had been exposed to, um, you know, along the way in the military. It just didn't make any sense to me, and I would have been an unhappy soul. Um, and so not saying I'm not an unhappy soul anyway, but um, for the most part, you know, it's it was the right call. It was the right call going into my own business, and now things are starting to really pick up nicely. All right. <laughs> Good stuff, dude. I could do this all day. I mean, I could too, but I'm thinking we should probably wrap it up because we're going back and forth, back and forth, covering some of the same stuff over to, yeah, I think so. What do you think? I don't know. I love, I, well, I love it. I love it. This is, this is um, fantastic. Listen, some people will love this and some people will be like, bro, wrap it up. Anyway. Yeah. Um, what else? What else? We should. You're going to see Danny while you're here? No? I am not going to see Danny. Uh, I don't have plans to because I got a quick. Bustamante? Obviously. Andy, I should see. Oh, I um, thought you were doing something with him, though. Well, he's. I'm doing. I'm running his um, his event. Okay. So he may or may not show up. He's got a bunch going on. So I'm okay. running his event uh, on Friday, Saturday, which should be great. Um, and then um, onto a client or two in in um, in Jacksonville. So we've got good stuff going on. You're gonna stay in. Much in, more to come. You staying in? Uh, you're gonna. I mean, you're retired, obviously. I am um, retired, um, keeping my own business, J3, but we're working a lot with um, Everyday Spy. I think you'll see a, a definite crossover in 24, pretty good. And you're staying in New Jersey? So? Staying in Jersey right now, Jersey Shore. Not going to um, move down to here? Not yet. It's so expensive, bro. I know, it is expensive. All those uh, but my kids there. are still there. There's all those Democrats so, up in there. I know. The blue state. I know. What are you thinking? The ocean's beautiful up there, though. It's beautiful down here, too. Um <laughs> Yeah, the kids are cool. my grandson and and my daughter and son-in-law, my son and his girlfriend. So um, I got to step there for a little bit of time. Plus, I got a new love interest, which is oh, awesome. So that's I, good. Um, I think I finally got it right. Well, I know I, I know I got it right. So oh yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah, when I got out of prison, like I, I wasn't even thinking about. Um, I I kind of figured like ah, that part of your life's over. Yeah. You know, you, you don't think to be in your fifties and fall in love. No, I, and, and I sixty. Yeah, you for know, me, to me, I thought, yeah, that, that's over. That's over. No, I, I thought the same thing. I was like, yeah. okay, I got, got, you know, two divorces, two tough ones, and then I'm like, yep, I'm good being alone. So I stayed alone for a year, man. Yeah, and then uh, I met this girl, and uh, I'm like, holy cow. But I think to me, like now, I realize how badly I did it before. Yeah, not that I'm still gonna do, doing doing bad thing or, or doing stupid things, you know, I'm still probably not as a, a, attentive. Um, I don't tell her she's beautiful enough. I don't do a lot of the stupid shit I should do that I, I blow off, but it's probably extreme. I know it's extremely important. Definitely. I need to make an effort at that more. Definitely. But at least now I realize that those are my problems and not, yeah. oh, oh, you're, you're this, you're that. No, no. All of those are my problem. Yep. I think when you start taking responsibility that everything is your problem. It's important. Everything is yeah. you. It's life changing. Changes everything. It does. Your yeah. perspective changes and you're like, yep, yeah, all this is, these are all my issues. All my negative core beliefs coming back. Yeah. You know, and uh, I don't want to dirty somebody else up kind of thing. Not good. Yeah. So we're doing good. Right. Look for, uh, check us out, you know, check us out on, uh, on Everyday Spy. And the, what, what is that? Is that, that's his, it, that's his does company. he have a YouTube channel? He does. Yeah. He's got uh, Everyday Spy YouTube. He's got, um, he's got a, a website, everydayspy.com. Right? Yep. And then, um, me, I'm, uh, I'm just like starting out my branding, but you can find me on, uh, LinkedIn. So hit me up with a note if I can help you. Yeah. I'd love to help. Hey, if you like the video, do me a favor. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the bell so you get notified of videos just like this. Please leave me a comment. Also, check the description box. We're going to leave all of Jim and Andy's uh, links in there. And please consider joining my Patreon. It's like 10 bucks a month. Really does help. Thank you very much. See ya.